Next, a hearing on what's called Corrections Day. That's a time congressional Republicans want to set aside during each Tuesday's House floor schedule to vote to end what some call unnecessary regulations. The House Rules Committee met today to set up days and floor procedures for Corrections Day. Among those testifying, Republican Barbara Vakanovich, who's in charge of coordinating the project. The hearing runs about an hour and 30 minutes. The, uh, the committee will come to order. Uh, the matter before the committee today is House Resolution 161. It is a resolution to amend House Rule 13 of Clause 4 to replace the consent calendar with a correction calendar. The idea for a Corrections Day originated with the Speaker of the House as a way to permit the House to take up bills that correct federal rules, regulations, or court decisions that are ambiguous, arbitrary, uh, ludicrous, and I think he even used the term downright silly. I know there are many of them that are silly in my neck of the woods. The proposed corrections process was seen as a way to pass relatively non-controversial and bipartisan bills while preserving the rights of committees to hold hearings and report the necessary uh, corrective legislation. Back on March 23rd of this year, the Speaker appointed a steering committee uh, to develop a framework for implementing a Corrections Day process. That steering committee group consisted of our first panel of witnesses today, Representatives Vukanovic, Zeloff, and McIntosh. On May 2nd, a joint hearing on Corrections Day was held by the Subcommittee on Rules uh, of the House uh, and the Subcommittee on National Economic Growth. Uh, the joint committee panel heard testimony from the speaker, the speaker's steering group, and several public witnesses. On June 6th, Mrs. Vukanovic introduced House Resolution 161, which I am pleased to be an original co-sponsor, along with Mr. Zeloff and Mr. McIntosh, and I think there may even be more by now. The resolution calls for replacing the existing obsolete consent calendar with a corrections calendar that would be called on the second and fourth Tuesdays of each month at the discretion of the speaker. Only bills reported by a primary committee of jurisdiction and placed on the union or house calendar could be placed on the corrections calendar by the speaker. Bills would be called in numerical order from the calendar and debated for one hour, divided between the chairman and the ranking member the bills would not be subject to amendment or intervening motion except amendments reported by the primary committee or offered by its chairman of the uh, committee of jurisdiction. A three-fifths vote would be required for passage of correction bills. I want to thank Mrs. Vukanovic, uh, Mr. Zeloff, and Mr. McIntosh for all of the hard work and long hours they put in on this, uh, this proposal. I know it's, uh, it's taken hours because I've sat in on many of those hours with you. Before I call on them for their statement, let me yield to my good friend from Massachusetts, the ranking minority member, Mr. Moakley, for any opening statement that he might have. Mr. Moakley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just about every Democrat I've ever talked to wants to get, a, get rid of stupid laws and unnecessary regulations. We all agree that there are far too many wasteful, useless provisions, and it's time to eliminate them. And I certainly don't think that Republicans are the only people who could sniff out these regulations in, and laws. In fact, on May 2nd of this year, your speaker said, this will not work if it is just a partisan game. But it will work if every member of the House feels that they have a standing and they have an opportunity to bring things to the floor and to be a part of the genuine effort to educate and to apply common sense to the bureaucracy. Now, I don't say this very often, but I completely agree with Speaker Gingrich in this matter. I think he was right. But still, despite your Speaker's proclamations, your proposal still doesn't allow Democrats to make cuts. In fact, the current plan for Corrections Day completely wipes out any semblance of minority rights. This resolution, resolution even goes farther. It goes so far to reduce the two-thirds vote to three-fifths. If the pro program slated for termination is so horrible, then why lower the vote margin from two-thirds to three-fifths? 
Mr. Chairman, your process also creates a whole new and, I might add, unnecessary procedure to give tremendous power to one person, namely Speaker Gingrich, and to gut what little power the Democratic Party has now. Over the last few years, I've gone deaf in my right ear from hearing howls of protest about minority rights from a fellow who used to serve in the Marine Corps who lives in northern New York. I this, who that is. This correction they plan makes those comments look very outdated. And Mr. Chairman, to be honest, we don't need a rule change to begin a correction <laughs> process. Republicans control all the committees. Republicans co control the agenda. Republicans control the floor schedule. You can bring up anything you want, and you probably will, and you'll probably win. So the new procedure is not necessarily, although the intention, I'm sure, is certainly good. But if you insist on creating a new procedure, and if you generally want, genuinely want democratic support, as Speaker Gingrich said, then you must be fair to us in the process. Either give the Democratic leader the right to sign off on any correction bill before it comes to the floor, or leave the vote threshold at two-thirds. If you'll not grant us either of these requests, I can only assume that there is a motive to the corrections process other than the one that the Republican Party has touted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Let me, um, before I'm yielding uh, to the vice chairman of our committee and the uh, chairman of the uh, <coughs> subcommittee of jurisdiction, uh, let me just say to my good friend from, from Boston, Massachusetts, that no one uh, wants to protect the rights of the minority more than I do. I was in this house for 16 years in the minority, and I know what it is to be persecuted by uh, a re un uh, unrelenting majority. And uh, over my dead body, will I ever let that happen to, uh, to anyone? I'll tell you, if you thought it was bad being the minority then, you ought to be in it now. <laughs> So um, I will say again to my good friend, Mr. Moakley, that uh, when we uh, debated this, and I did sit on many of the meetings, and we'll hear some testimony from the witnesses, we did everything that we could to protect the committee system, because I think that's what makes this Congress a truly deliberative body. It is the committee system. And when the appropriators come down and they try to legislate on appropriation bills, we try to prevent that in this committee. We're going to do everything we can to protect it. I won't get into the other details about the uh, two thirds versus the three-fifths, but we can do that during uh, certainly colloquies that we will have with the witnesses. Having said that, let me yield to the vice chairman of the uh, full committee, David Dreyer, uh, who also um, spearheaded the, uh, the um, reforms that we have made in this Congress as far as committees and subcommittees and in protecting the committee system. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, begin by saying that uh, it was a privilege for me to work with uh, our colleagues, Barbara Vukanovic, Bill Zeloff, and David McIntosh as we pursued this Corrections Day process, and I'd like to congratulate them on completing uh, what clearly was a very difficult task. I find it uh, rather ironic that projects which are intended to be bipartisan and non-controversial uh, tend to be the most difficult tasks for us to complete. But I think that the institution and the American people will be served better by this Corrections Day process, which we are pursuing. I know a lot of my colleagues are wondering exactly what bill will constitute the first corrections measure to be considered under this new process, and uh, I believe that that distinction should probably go to this legislation itself uh, as we proceed. If approved uh, by the House, this resolution will modernize an existing, uh, underutilized, and clearly obsolete calendar, what's known as the consent calendar, which has not been used since the 101st Congress. And that explanation fits the definition of a corrections measure established by the Vukanovich Task Force. As you know, Mr. Chairman, a compelling case for a corrections calendar was made at the joint hearing that uh, David McIntosh and I had uh, last month. Such a calendar will provide tremendous focus and visibility to the efforts of this Congress to rein in what most of us would agree are, as was said, misguided, onerous, and arbitrary federal laws and regulations. It's important to point out that the proposed corrections calendar procedure maintains the existing procedure of reporting bills from the Committee of Jurisdiction and that the House leadership will retain the same flexibility to utilize any of the current procedural mechanisms used for calling up legislative measures for floor consideration in lieu of using the corrections calendar uh, uh, device. 
It's my hope that the vast majority of measures placed on the corrections calendar will in fact come up under suspension of the rules and uh, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And I would like to add just one thing, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned uh, in introducing me that I had uh, worked on the reforms that we are now under today. And with all due respect to my very dear friend, the former chairman from South Boston, we at the outset of the 104th Congress did many things which benefited the minority at the expense of our new majority. And I think uh, specifically uh, of the elimination of proxy voting. Now, as we all know, in this committee, we haven't had proxy voting. But I've got to tell you, more than a couple of our new committee chairmen have come to me and stated uh, the fact that uh, it is very difficult for them to complete their work without proxy voting. And we don't have rolling quorums any longer in these committees. When, before I served on this committee, I participated in a, in a committee where that was the norm. And so there are a wide range of things, and I know we joke that life uh, as a member of the minority is more difficult today than it might have been in the past, but I would argue that as Mr. Solomon said, he served for 16 years as a member of the minority, and we have been very sincerely sensitive to the needs of uh, the minority here in our reforms. And again, it has been in, in many instances at the expense of uh, our majority and our attempts to, to uh, move our legislative proposals through. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, thank you. And Mr. Bielinson, do you have an opening statement? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bielinson of California. Thanks. I ordinarily don't, but I, I, I have prepared one for this one because we've we had a prior hearing on this, and and it'll perhaps save us some some time later on by raising some questions now, which, which perhaps some of the folks who Jeff, testified uh, later Jeff on. Is the ranking minority member of the subcommittee which held that uh, hearing? And a member of the new minority. Right. And a member of the new minority. And very sensitive to minority problems and rights <laughs> in a way that he wasn't earlier. Right. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to thank the Chairman, as, as Mr. Moakley has, for agreeing to the request that, that uh, Mr. Oakley and I uh, made to allow a day between the hearing and the markup of this measure and to have testimony from public witnesses at this hearing. At the May 2nd subcommittee hearing on the subject, we did not have a specific proposal before us. Uh, now that we do, we will all benefit from hearing what congressional scholars as well as members think about this proposal. And by having some time in between the hearing and the markup, uh, we will have the opportunity to develop a response that addresses concerns that are raised during this hearing. So we thank you, Mr. Chairman, for acceding to our requests. Uh, most of us probably feel that if the Speaker wishes to call certain bills correction bills and to establish an advisory panel to serve as a clearinghouse for ideas for changing problematic laws and regulations, that's fine. I suspect that some of the corrections ideas may well turn out to be more complex and controversial than they appear at first blush. But we all know of regulations that are not working well in practice, and if this process helps enable us to act more effectively to eliminate or to improve them, then it's certainly worth trying. In fact, having a corrections process could turn out to be a great idea. From time to time, uh, constituents bring thoughtful ideas to me, and I'm sure to all of my colleagues, when they go back home, about changes that they think should be made in some law. And I send their ideas over to the appropriate committees, but we do not always get a response. In fact, we don't usually get a response. Or even the assurance that the committee is looking into the matter. Being able to submit ideas to an advisory panel that carries more weight with committees and with the leadership might give us a new avenue to pursue changes. So I think that, that's a, that uh, holds out some real hope for improvement. In addition, one result of that kind of process might be better oversight by our committees. As a result of the advisory group sending the committee some proposals, those committees might do a better job of finding out how agencies are implementing laws, discovering where the problem areas are, and figuring out how the laws and their implementation can be improved. And if better, better oversight results from this process, it will indeed have turned out to be a very useful, very constructive tool. What concerns us, however, about the Corrections Day idea is the rule change before us, the proposal to establish a separate and distinct legislative procedure for considering corrections bills. As several of the witnesses at the May 2nd hearing testified, it's not necessary to establish a different floor procedure for corrections bills to have a corrections day. We could simply use the existing suspension process, and many of us urge the Speaker to do just that. After all, if these bills are relatively non-controversial, there should be no reason why they cannot win the support of two-thirds of the House. By establishing a separate set of procedures for these bills with a different margin for passage will only further complicate our legislative process and make it even more difficult for everyone to understand how it works. Worse than the fact that this, that this procedure unnecessarily complicates our legislative process 
is the fact that it violates minority rights, something Mr. Mokley spoke about, and which I agree with him about completely, and something that everyone on this committee, especially our new chairman, has had a great deal of concern with over the years. Sometime between May 2nd, when the Speaker testified at our joint subcommittee hearing, and last week, when this resolution was introduced, the Corrections Day idea took a turn for the worse. Speaker Gingrich was adamant, absolutely adamant, about the importance of making this process bipartisan. Yet we have a proposal before us that spurns any sense of bipartisanship, that completely defies the spirit in which the Speaker presented the Corrections Day idea. After listening to his remarks, it's difficult to understand how we could possibly be considering the proposal before us. First, so far as we know, no minority members were consulted in the development of the rule change. Second, the proposal that's been introduced would deny minority floor rights, amendments, motions to recommit, votes on the previous question in defiance of the well-accepted tradition of requiring a two-thirds vote to do so. Third, we've thus, had, thus far had no assurances that the minority members of the advisory panel will be chosen by the minority leader, as is the long-standing tra uh, tradition in the House for membership on bipartisan panels of any sort. There was an opportunity to make Corrections Day a proposal that would be supported broadly, if, not, if not unanimously, in the House. And actually, it's not too late to make it, to make it so if the majority would agree to use of the existing legislative process for corrections and would bring minority members chosen by our leadership into the process of determining how corrections bills will be selected and handled, then I believe the proponents would be pleasantly surprised at how much support and how little controversy there would be over the Corrections Day idea. So we commend the idea. We commend you for pursuing this idea, I would say to the chairman and to our friends who are appearing before us. We think, as I said a moment or two ago, and as Mr. Mokley said some minutes ago, you've taken the wrong turn in recent weeks, and we hope we can come back to a path which all of us uh, can walk down together. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, at uh, some time during the markup, or maybe even late in the hearing, we could uh, discuss uh, the differences between suspensions and, uh, and the uh, calendar that we propose. But at this point, are, are there uh, any opening statements by other members of the body? Mr. Linder, no. Uh, Mrs. Price? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Just very briefly. I think that this Corrections Day uh, legislation really signals to the American people that Congress is, is listening, finally, and that uh, it will highlight that Congress is making efforts to make the legislati legislative and regulatory process one that's fairer and more rational. And it also signals that we as elected officials are really willing to do what we were elected to do. Uh, and take responsibility for the job that we were elected to do. And if things are wrong, it's our job to correct them, uh, not to wait for some a federal bureaucrat or the federal bureaucracy to catch up with itself uh, if it ever does. And so I'm very um, uh, proud to be a part of this process, and I commend uh, our panel for the hard work that they've done. I welcome the opportunity. Uh, to bring this to being because I think that uh, we are here to address the interests of the hardworking American taxpayers, uh, not the special interests who are looking away uh, for a way around federal regulation and legislation, but uh, if this process is used correctly, it will be a great thing for America. Thank you very much. And I hope, Mr. Mokley, that we can do it in a bipartisan way. I thank the, uh, the gentlelady. Uh, if there's no, <clears throat> no further statements, let's go right to the witnesses. Uh, Barbara Bukanovich, uh, the uh, chairman of this uh, task force, I know has a very important um, military construction appropriation meeting coming up almost momentarily. So uh, let's recognize her. We may have to excuse her and let the other two uh, stay here. But uh, Mrs. Bukanovich, we commend you for a great job well done along with your colleagues. And uh, you have the floor. Feel free, free to summarize. Your entire statement will appear in the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I thank Mr. Mokley also for agreeing to hold this hearing today. As you mentioned, Mr. Solomon, Congressman Zeliff McIntosh and I were asked by Speaker Gingrich to develop a procedure for the House to deal with, quote, dumb laws and regulations. The idea being that we should have a mechanism in the House to quickly fix serious errors in law or federal regulations. I know we all received numerous calls from our constituents pointing out problems with government which need attention. And I've been frustrated by the fact that there really isn't any current rapid response system in Congress to deal with obvious problems in the law, even if there's general agreement that something should be fixed. On the surface, Corrections Day seemed like an easy proposition. After all, none of us 
regardless of whether we're, what our partisan affiliation or ideology are in favor of perpetuating ridiculous and wasteful laws. The challenge for our steering committee was not so much recommending a method to deal with these issues expeditiously as it was to ensure that the House not compound one mistake with yet another. With this as our first concern, we've introduced HRES 161. This resolution strikes a balance between the need for quick action on ridiculous laws and appropriate caution to ensure the cure is not worse than the, worse than the disease. It does so by requiring committee hearings and markup before, before floor consideration. In this way, the members of Congress who work daily on the subject area will have the opportunity to weigh the evidence make needed amendments and forward the legislation to the full house if they feel the issue really needs immediate action. In this regard, corrections bills will be handled no differently than any other piece of legislation. It will be in floor consideration, however, where corrections bill, bills will take a path different from other bills. The speaker will have discretion to place a bill on a new calendar called the corrections calendar. After a required three-day layover on the corrections calendar, a bill may be brought up for consideration immediately on the second or fourth Tuesday of the month. Once on the floor, our recommendation is that the bill be debated and voted on in an expeditious manner. One hour of debate will be allowed with no amendments unless offered by the committee chairman. Final passage will require three-fifths of those present and voting with no motion to recommit allowed. It's the steering committee's opinion that the three-fifths majority is a necessary precaution to prevent ill-considered or partisan initiatives from passing on the corrections procedure. Because we're recommending no amendments on the floor, we believe a three-fifths requirement is a reasonable standard. <coughs> this raises the obvious question of why not just use the suspension of the rules procedure and its two-thirds requirement. We believe that the required committee consideration and committee report call for a slightly lower standard than suspension, suspension of the rules. Three-fifths is a logical level of support for items which have been fully debated in committee. Three-fifths will mean that the minority party will have sufficient votes to stop items, yet also allow those with, bi with bipartisan support to pass. Creation of the corrections calendar would not preclude bills from being considered under suspension of the rules or under a rule from this committee. It's our hope that these other options would be used sparingly to avoid confusion and delay. Through frequent use of the corrections calendar, members of Congress and the public will become aware of this option. Once it becomes known that we can fix these problems in an expedited way, the general public will come to rely on it and begin to suggest other corrections bills. Who knows, Congress might build a reputation for solving real problems for real people in a reasonable period of time. To put in place the means to build this sort of reputation is the goal of our committee. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I will listen to the rest of my members, but I do have a four o'clock appropriations uh, mark. Well, Mrs. Vikonovich, we, uh, we really appreciate your, your testimony and feel free to leave at any, uh, any point. Um, Thank you. Now that I look at it, Fine. I've got to leave. All right. uh, Mr. Zellif, I have answers to a lot of okay. questions. Okay. And, Great. and um, Mr. Zellif of New Hampshire, uh, we had a, the opportunity to see you on television much of the weekend, and uh, it's nice to ha have you back here in Washington. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, the moose looked better, Joe. Now, wait we got a minute, Joe. And it was, uh, from Mr. Markley's point of view, it was definitely a New Hampshire moose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to first commend you and your staff for the hard work and support you've given all of us in coming up with this proposal. We couldn't have done it without you, and it was a bipartisan effort. I don't want to take long on this, but I'm going to just spend a few minutes to explain how the three of us envision a correction. There really is no official explanation of what a correction is, although I would classify it as a piece of legislation which addresses the rules, regulations, and laws which impose a severe financial burden, are ambiguous, arbitrary, and ludicrous. This bill would be very narrow in scope and would have to be relatively non-controversial. So I see it as a very bipartisan effort. In essence, we're looking for some of the stupidest, dumbest, silliest things that the federal government does. And I'm sure there's plenty out there to look at. So we can then correct it. You have to go out there to look at it. Though. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> I think the best way to define a correction, however, is through some examples. 
When the speaker testified in front of the joint hearing of Mr. McIntosh and Mr. Dreyer's subcommittees, he talked about some examples that included uh, wastewater treatment plant in San Diego and lifestyle audits done by the IRS. Another correction might be a waiver of certain environmental regulations for airports. Right now, in my own home state, in an airport in Manchester, New Hampshire, cannot cut down trees to improve landing conditions and overall visibility and safety for ground control and pilots because those trees have to sit in a wetland. There should be waivers issued for this situation, not only in the name of the airline safety, but because it's common sense to cut down trees when they get in the way. Hopefully, through our corrections process, we'll be able to put some of that common sense approach into this work. Possibilities are endless. There are surely thousands of examples that we may not be aware of yet, which leads me to my second point. Members who have ideas for corrections should have that idea drafted into legislative language and give a copy to either Barbara, David, or myself, or our staffs, and should be prepared to do the necessary legwork necessary for passage. As currently structured, the three of us will act as a clearinghouse for corrections ideas and as a liaison between the member, leadership, and the committees. As Mrs. Bukanovich mentioned, the corrections will not subvert the normal committee process. We will work closely with all three parties to hopefully see that the member's idea makes it to final passage. Mr. Chairman, what we're trying to do here is take a step forward, ending over 40 years of government saying that we know best. For 40 years, the American people have been slowly surrounded by thousands and thousands of government regulations. Many of these regulations do the same thing, but come from different departments. The overlapping in some cases is, is astounding. We have to say enough is enough. We have to return this country and its government to its people. They pay the bill, they put us here, and they deserve better. Bottom line, Mr. Chairman, is that getting rid of un unnecessary rules, regulations, and laws should be a top priority for all of us. The Corrections Day process is an idea whose time has come. I hope members on both sides of the aisle can see the wisdom of this great idea, and we look forward to participating. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. We thank you, Mr. Zeloff. And uh, as a uh, small businessman from the private sector, we know you speak with a lot of experience. Uh, Mr. McIntosh, one of the new members of this House and one of the most active members, it's a pleasure to have you come before us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moakley. And also wanted to thank Mr. Dreyer and Mr. Bielenson for participating in the joint hearing with our subcommittee on this issue early on. I think we brought forth many of the purposes of this and, and some very good ideas. I want to commend Mrs. Bukanovich and Mr. Zeliff for, and Mr. Dreyer, really, for distilling them down to this new process. I view it as a continuation of what we started at the beginning of this year in applying the laws of Congress to members of Congress, opening up the committee process. Today we're establishing a corrections day process where the legislation that is necessary to correct problems that arise out of the regulatory programs of the government can easily and efficiently be brought to the floor of the House. Um, the goal of Corrections Day is not easy or not difficult to support. Um, recently, Sam Donaldson reported on Primetime Live of several examples of regulatory overkill. One of them, he had a reporter standing in a dry stream bed in Arizona uh, trying to look for water to put little fish in that are required to be introduced into the stream in order to test for water quality. Well, there's never water in that stream bed, and it was difficult for them to actually make that test. Uh, finally, Sam asked Mrs. Browner at EPA if this made any sense, and she agreed no, uh, that's an overly broad regulation and needed to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis, something that EPA regulations didn't allow. Um, so uh, I may only be a freshman, but if you've got a problem that Newt Gingrich, Sam Donaldson, and Carol Browner all agree exists, then it's got to be a good idea that we try to fix it. And the American people have understood this. They uh, be have made a bestseller out of The Death of Common Sense, a book detailing many of the problems with government regulations. And I think we've all heard horror stories from our constituents. And as Mr. Bielenson mentioned, sometimes you find it difficult to actually take action to correct them. The Corrections Day calendar will provide that type of vehicle for members. It will allow the individual members to encourage the committees of jurisdiction to take action and hold a committee. And by having the speakers and his advisory committee directly involved, I think, move the process forward. Um, one of the problems that I keep hearing over and over again are cases where two agencies have conflicting rules and regulations. Sometimes it's the fault of the agencies involved. Sometimes it's a problem in law. 
that the agencies don't have the ability to fix. Uh, one example was a, a food processing plant that one, one agency told it it had to keep its floors dried at all times, and another agency told it that it had to mop up after the food processing, and it wasn't possible to obey both of those guidelines. Another one came up in our subcommittee hearings on the regulatory sunset bill where Kay Whitehead, who's a farmer in Indiana, a very successful pig farmer, has to figure out how to dispose of the waste from pig farming. Um, it's something very important to her. Generally, she spreads it on her fields as manure to help fertilize the fields. And one agency, the Soil Conservation Agency, tells her she has to spread it on top of the field because plowing it in might lead to erosion. Another agency, the IDEM, or State EPA affiliate, tells her, no, she has to put it into the ground because of the possible release of methane gas and other pollutants. Um, she says she doesn't care which one she has to do, but she wants an official guideline. She did concede that her neighbors had a preference for the EPA <laughs> approach since they have to deal with the smell. Um, other examples uh, come up where the agencies simply don't have the flexibility and we need to address it as a matter of law here in this Congress. So we could go on for days with various examples. I'll submit for the record uh, the transcript from the primetime live show with Mr. Donaldson and Mrs. Browner. And I commend the committee for looking at this and urge you to go forward with this rules change. <coughs> Mr. McIntosh and uh, Mr. Zeliff, uh, we certainly appreciate your, your very cogent testimony. Uh, that wasn't uh, on Sam Donaldson's wool and mohair farm, was it, out, uh, out there? <laughs> um, Good my good Not friend Mr. Bielenson mentioned earlier uh, that uh, these correction bills may be more complex and more controversial. Um, if so, I would just say to my good friend, and uh, that makes them much more difficult to uh, to pass with a with a three uh, fifths vote. Um, I mentioned at the original testimony of the original hearings uh, several of the. Uh, of the serious problems that many of these, um, as you quoted, Bill, ambiguous, arbitrary, and ludicrous uh, uh, measures, as well as uh, stupidest, dumbest, and silliest, I think you said as well, uh, that how it's affected my district, which is made up primarily of small entrepreneurial businesses uh, up and down the Hudson River from New York City to Montreal. But I, I would just point out that from the uh, proposal that you have submitted to us uh, to mark up, uh, Bills on suspension are for non-controversial, low-cost or no-cost uh, bills that usually pass with a unanimous vote. Anytime we have a um, suspension calendar, 90% uh, of them pass with, uh, with, a, with a voice vote, with uh, no votes against them at all. Um, a proposed uh, correction bill may or not, may not uh, meet that criteria, most probably not. Because, you know, um, in this Congress, there are many who, uh, who really believe that big government does know best and that, uh, you know, what uh, they, they think that government control uh, really is, is what is needed. But there are many of us that don't. And uh, we've just passed um, a uh, risk analysis uh, and cost analysis uh, legislation uh, that, that hopefully is going to change a lot of that. But nevertheless, a lot of these rules and, and, uh, that are promulgated by, uh, by bureaucrats are still out there and causing great problems. The big difference is that uh, we don't propose, as I think one of our colleagues said, that we are taking away from the Democrat minority. The truth of the matter is that a Speaker of the House, whoever that is, Democrat or Republican today, can uh, select a piece of legislation that has not even been reported from committee, put it on the suspension calendar, and have a vote on it. Uh, we don't propose that at all. As a matter of fact, we are proposing to take these silly and dumb regulations and bring them to the floor after they have gone through the regular committee process, which I think is very important in which case the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, majority minority, have, uh, have full input into how those bills are marked up. Then, if the Speaker sees fit, he could bring that to the floor for a straight up or down vote. But it is subject uh, to a three-fifths vote uh, if, uh, if, if it is a controversial measure. So there's quite a bit of difference in what we are proposing, and I, uh, I commend you for it. And uh, 
Hopefully on Thursday we will uh, mark up with uh, with Democrat input into the uh, into the new rule that will uh, help to correct some of these problems. Mr. Uh, Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, thank uh, the two of you and obviously Ms. Vukanovic. Uh, she had to leave for your very helpful testimony again for your fine work. I think that something that has been uh, overlooked here um, has been the fact that many people believe that once something has uh, become law, once a regulation has been promulgated, there's nothing that can be done. Now this came about, uh, this proposal from Speaker Gingrich following a conversation that he had with uh, the mayor of San Diego dealing with uh, tremendous costs that would be imposed to deal with uh, a water problem uh, in San Diego, forcing uh, Great Lakes water standards on the uh, Pacific Coast, which was preposterous. Now, as Tony Bielenson said and others have said, we have often constituents who come to us and say, here's something that is absolutely crazy, should not be uh, in law, should not be a regulation imposed on us. Uh, but we understand that there's no way you can deal with it. I think that what Speaker Gingrich felt very strongly about was the need to let the American people know that with this Corrections Day process, there is a vehicle for their representative in Congress to come to us, come to the committee that will be put together dealing with this, and, uh, and make some recommendations as to how we could quickly turn around what is obviously a very serious problem. So I think that, that while some have said, why are we going through these changes and, and all, I believe that it is in large part to send a signal to the American people that they today will have an opportunity. I mean, when we put this into place, they will have an opportunity to have their voice heard, to have that very common sense uh, approach which they're seeking actually implemented. And uh, so I thank you all for, uh, for your effort on this, and I look forward to working closely with you as we proceed with the markup and then as we begin our work looking at legislation which will uh, come forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Moakley. Uh, I agree uh, that a lot of work has been put into it and uh, there can be disagreement. You want to turn your microphone on, Joe? I'd like to hear it. Well, I, this wasn't meant for your ears, David. I <laughs> think <laughs> um, I know a lot of work has been put in and by my colleague, David, I know how sincere and how busy he's been putting uh, a lot of these proposals together. But one of the things that bothers me is raising it to three-fifths. I think two-thirds is an, uh, enough of a barrier to get through because you're talking affirmatively, well, you need uh, so many votes to pass it, but you, you, only, you need few votes to stop it from going through, too. It's, it's a two-edged sword. And uh, do you have any commitment from the Senate that they're going to address this as seriously as this committee, uh, uh, you people have addressed it? Well, my, uh, my observation is, and having talked to uh, Senator Dole, uh, that uh, they, once we get this formatted here, so once we get this formatted here, uh, that, that the Senate uh, believes that it's a good idea and will do everything they can to, uh, to work it out and try to um, make it happen over there as well. But it's more a deliberative body. It's going to take a little longer. If I might just add to that, the, the three-fifths vote actually parallels the requirement in the Senate to close debate, which no. is the, the key thing that slows down some of the progress over there. And so in some ways it parallels the ability to, to get it through both houses. Well, the, the, the thing I look at, there are many things that happen in the Senate uh, that that uh, if we ever tried it in the House would be hung from the yard arm. I mean, uh, they talk about secrecy. I mean, in, in the Senate, as you well know, one member can put a hold on the bill. It, it, it takes the CIA to find out what that, who that member is. I mean, we could never do that in, in this body. Um, you know, we all agree that there's merit in, in trying to get rid of foolish laws, but I'm concerned that in the guise uh, of ridding ourselves of capricious laws, we might be excluding participation by the public affected by the change and shutting out ideas that might be uh, contrary to uh, the other side. 
And I think, while it's very important the Speaker have the ability to move his agenda in the Congress, and I'm sure that whether this passes or not, it's not going to stop our Speaker from moving things through Congress, as we've seen by the previous coming attractions. But uh, I think that uh, we should be very careful not to place too much power in his hands. Uh, I, so would you be willing to alter your proposal to include a sign-off by the minority leader, uh, just to show that uh, non-controversial nature of bills that may become uh, correction days material? I believe that, that in, uh, please jump in, but uh, the testimony that, that we received before, uh, we had good participation on both sides of the aisle. They thought this was a good idea. You know, I think, uh, frankly, that any time you do something different, you create change, uh, you have people concerned that, you know, uh, but, but this is such a good idea that I think with over time, I think everybody will settle into the idea that three-fifths is right, uh, that it is meant to be bipartisan uh, with, with general consensus on both sides of the aisle. I mean, that's the direction the speaker has given us. And as we receive different ideas, uh, we're, we're looking to make this process work. We're not looking to have a lot of controversy over it. So it, it's generally going to be a magnet to collect things that are basically uh, so has such great uh, support on both sides of the aisle that they go through quickly, and that's the purpose of putting well, it on a fast track. Then why freeze out uh, some of the uh, activity by the minority party? Would, would the gentleman leave you? Uh, uh, would, do you want me to leave or yield? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that for no, I want you to uh, stay. Uh, <clears throat> let me just say that uh, I think, though, this points out uh, part of the problem. And uh, I don't want to get political in, in this because it's a problem that we really are trying to solve. But uh, the fact remains that the minority leader, who used to be the majority leader, uh, was responsible, and I'm just quoting a number of conservative Democrats now, uh, was responsible for gagging them from being able to have these kind of issues uh, uh, debated on the floor. And you can see that with a contract with America, where almost every item, all of the ten items, had uh, strong, strong bipartisan support, primarily from a minority within uh, that majority party at the time. And certainly, if you're going to have the minority leader have to sign off on this, you're going to be right back in the same boat. We never would be able to have those issues. We had Mr. Brewster, I think, at our hearing. Wasn't it Mr. Brewster? Um, testify uh, from the government uh, uh, relations Committee uh, that uh, uh, Peterson, uh, Peterson, Mr. Colin Peterson, Peterson, Colin yeah. Peterson, who very strongly supports this whole concept because he was one who could never get his viewpoint uh, onto the floor, and now he's going to be able to. And Mr. Chairman, Mr. Right, he was. Uh, yes. That's right. I hope I didn't hear what I think I heard. You're not trying to get any of these things that you advertise as contract for America in under this. Uh, uh, mechanism, are you? Thank you no, it's all been taken care of. No, We're on a new 100 days now. Well, Although most of them would have passed with the three-fifths vote, wouldn't they? <laughs> That's right. That's what I say. Well, thank, thanks thanks about 65 Mr. Uh, Democrats. Mr. McIntosh, you want to respond? Uh, let, let me just add, and, and Mr. Peterson is the ranking member on our subcommittee, and we plan to be active in identifying regulations that could fit into the correction state calendar, and I'd want to work very closely with him in doing that. Um, and he was frustrated that a lot of these issues couldn't have been addressed earlier. I think the key dynamic here is that we're creating political credit for people to bring forward some, correcting the problem rather than adding a new program or a new regulation. And that switch in mindset that takes place in this body and, and hopefully will grow into other parts of the government here, I think is an important change that, that will be for the good of the American people. That, we say, okay, let's look at what's there and see if there are ways we can, can change it or undo problems. But all we're asking is for some kind of uh, compromise, you know, move it from three-fifths to two-fifths or, or else allow the minority leader... Two-fifths? Two I mean... Uh, <laughs> uh, and allow the minority leader uh, the ability to, to sign off. I mean, I just don't think that's, I mean, I think your problem is going to be, you know, in law, when you're talking about a reasonable time and, and you can uh, spend four weeks saying what reasonable is, you imagine trying to say what silly is or ill-conceived and some of these other phrases you use. I mean, we, we may have to rely on Justice Stewart's standard of we'll know it when we see it, but. Well, uh, we know when we feel it. But 
But I think that, uh, I, I just think there are so many things. That's all right. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Okay. Yeah. But I, I think that, uh, really, seriously, I think we should have, uh, we should have uh, the opportunity to, to uh, you know, change the, the majority in this thing, or, or have the minority like leader. I'd, I'd like to change the majority, but I'd like to change the vote that, that you proposed uh, to where it is now. Well, I believe this, the speaker has every uh, every intention, and so does uh, whatever ad hoc uh, advisory committee that might be uh, uh, involved, uh, certainly to con to consult with uh, with minority members, uh, regardless of their philosophical persuasion, liberal, conservative, or what have you. Mr. Uh, Dreyer. Oh, no, you've had your piece. Mr. Linder of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to just say to the two gentlemen testifying that I'm sorry that it's come to this, that we have to have a corrections day to get rid of dumb things. I'm sorry that they even exist in the lexicon of politics. Most of the regulatory reach and the, and the law, legislation we passed have, has all started for noble purposes and falls victim to the laws of unintended consequences. Um, but we've all heard the stories, and they're still there. And they're, they're increasing, not decreasing. I'll, I'll never forget the one speech given by a gentleman named Ed Rust, who was at the time president of State Farm Insurance, I think, who said that when I'm not running an insurance company, I'm a farmer. And I actually work a farm with cattle and fixed fences. And he said the, regula the government has come up with a regulation and said if you have a stream running through your farm, your cattle may drink from the stream, but they may not be per allowed to relieve themselves in it. He said, now, I can explain that to you, but I'm having a tough time explaining it to the cattle. Um, I suppose the farming industry has as many regulatory overreaches as any others, but uh, I'm anxious and interested to see precisely the mechanism you're going to undertake to, to achieve this, but I, I uh, congratulate you and welcome you to the task. Mr. Bielinson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of questions that need to be asked and, and answered, and we're not going to have time one can see t t today to do it. Um, I'll try to be very brief, and I'll just ask two or three questions, but I do hope... We've got until 9 o'clock tonight. I understand, but, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to stay, but I'm not sure how late everyone else is going to be able to stay. I do hope that our, that our Republican colleagues on, on this committee will listen carefully to some of the qualms and questions that we have, because if I may, if I may be so presumptuous, it's not absolutely necessary, I hope, Mr. Chairman, for you to accept exactly what's been proposed to you by this group. And because all of us, in fact, think it's a nice idea and would like to find some bipartisan way of, of doing it, um, maybe we can even come up with some alternative way to, to do this and not necessarily buy into everything specifically that's being proposed by, by this nice group of, of, of three members. So I hope that you'll, you'll listen carefully, and I hope that we can work together on this. Um, my, my first question, and, and Ms. Vukanovic answered it briefly, although it didn't, it wasn't the answer was not compelling to me. I'm sorry she's not here. Assuming we all, as, as I think it's fair to, to assume, want to try a corrections process, and assuming that the principal reason, as the speaker said over and over again, I'm quoting him, was to send a signal. In other words, we, just, we want to have a corrections calendar. That's fine. Why can we not, why is it not better to at least start it off, try it, without changing the rules, just by designating one or two suspension calendars each month as corrections day or a corrections suspension calendar, and try that? You know, let's just try it. We'll come up with some bills. This isn't necessarily for you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just sort of throwing it out as a possible alternative way of doing it. We don't even yet know, to be utterly frank about it, what bills we're talking about. You know, three or four specific things have been mentioned. Most often the, the San Diego problem, which as members know, if they were at the May 2nd meeting, is enormously complex. I would guess could not be adequately handled on any kind of suspension or consent calendar in any case which opposed strongly by the ranking minority member, Mr. Mineta, of the Committee of Jurisdiction, it just seems to me would not be the kind of thing you'd, that, that we've been thinking about, even though it may be truly stupid, it's, it's also truly complex. Um, so we don't quite know yet exactly. We don't have a list of 25 particular bills, for example. Why don't we just, as, you know, as, as people come up with ideas for things to be on a corrections calendar, try putting them, you know, Tuesday after next, whatever it is, on that, on that week's suspension calendar. And see what happens, rather than coming up with a new process. Did, did you give any thought to that, may I ask our two, our two colleagues on the, 
on our task force here. Yeah, well, let me say, uh, we did consider the, the option of, of using both current proceedings, the one that requires two-thirds vote and one requires majority vote with regular order, and simply uh, deciding, depending on the issue, which one we would use. And there was a, a, and frankly, I was one of the people who had sympathy towards let's have a majority vote because I'd like to bring more of these forward quickly. And um, was convinced by my colleagues that no, we, we need to increase the threshold somewhat so that it puts some discipline into the system that you do have to get support on both sides of the aisle. I, I don't think you'd have any opposition from any member if you'd started off trying it that way. I mean, try it that way. Call it corrections. Require the two-thirds vote so the minority, in this case it's ourselves, but you know, would have no you know, questions about rights being trampled or whatever. Um, it just seems to me that would be a, a more sensible, more conservative, you know, more careful way of, of starting it. And if you need to do it some other way, well, you know, if, if dozens of these things show Mr. up, Bill's maybe one, you only have three of them. You what know, I was persuaded by, with them. by was that, that what we needed to do was have an expedited process to bring these up regularly. And that in exchange for doing that, you had to require that the member reach a higher threshold than majority. And, and the three-fifths vote was that higher threshold. Sure, but the two-thirds vote. Would, would the gentleman purpose. yield at that point? Sure. Uh, I would just point out two things. Uh, and I did earlier that um, a suspension calendar, if we were to go to the status quo and bring these up on a suspension calendar, it bypasses the committee system. I object to that. Um, I, uh, as the gentleman knows, had some concern about uh, a, uh, a simple majority vote because then we're doing something else that reflects uh, against the minority. That is, we're in effect putting out a closed rule because these, amend these bills cannot be amended. And to put them on a, um, on a calendar and then say uh, that uh, you have a, a simple majority vote, that means you're putting out a closed rule with no amendments and, and it doesn't show up as a closed rule. I, I objected to that. So uh, we, we've been kicking around exactly what you're talking about, Tony, and, uh, and your, your points are well taken. Well, and, right. and I became convinced that this balanced all the different interests. But I, I think if, if we, you know, again, change is some, sometimes tough. But I think that the key here, if we really believe in the, in the goal of having bipartisan support to try to get those issues out here, we're going to be very careful in terms of selection process, those issues that, that really should be fast-tracked and are truly ridiculous, that both sides are going to agree. And, and why not give this a chance after we evaluate all the alternatives? Will the gentleman yield for just a moment? Sure. Your... Let, let me just say that uh, if, if one looks at the, at the history of this, most of the items which do come up under suspension of the rules uh, do go through the committee process. And it seems to me that uh, uh, the gentleman's points are, are very well taken. And even if we do Which make these changes, I'm it? talking about your points, Tony. Thanks. And it seems to me that if we, if we uh, do proceed with this, uh, certainly at the outset, most of these items will be coming up under suspension of the rules. And that is my sense as we begin moving ahead with it, which would in fact do uh, uh, almost identically with uh, what you're advocating. How could they, could they, David, come up under suspension? I mean, you just... Sure. But there no, would be could, corrections. They I mean, could they come wouldn't. up under suspension of the rules. They but could be brought up under suspension of the rules, and then that two-thirds requirement Speaker vote would be there. Now. You're losing me. Well, I mean, but you under this want a separate, suspension, uh, separate corrections calendar. That's what we're talking about. Focus. But under, if, sure. if I may uh, butt in here, you'd be able to amend this as, as opposed to the current suspension uh, calendar. You can't amend uh, a bill coming on the suspension calendar. No, and you can't amend this one either. Right. You can amend. You can amend it on. The chairman can amend it. Right, right. But nobody else. But if you but want to amend it, you have to go through the regular rules process. Come to the rules committee. Right. Let me ask one uh, other, just one okay. other sort of general question. Okay. okay. As I read the resolution, it's just that we only have these chaps, you know, yeah. at first, then we go on to all our other people. But yeah. since they're the ones who come up with this and, and have to deal with it, as I understand your resolution that you're proposing, proposed rule change. Um, nothing happens until after a bill has been favorably reported. That is, as you read it, the first thing in here, uh, we resolve to amend the rules to read as follows in 4A. After a bill has been favorably reported and placed on either the union or house calendar, the speaker may file with the clerk a notice requesting that such a bill also be placed on a special calendar to be known as the corrections calendar. So it sounds as though this whole corrections process kicks in after a bill has been favorably reported, Correct. not before. Correct. So. Well, maybe you could just take another minute, because that I had always thought and envisioned that, that people would come to us with bills that were, would correct stupid, silly, and dumb things.
things and that somehow, you know, we would fast track them through some kind of process. But that doesn't seem to be the case. What happens? You intro I introduce a bill. You know, each of it introduces a number of bills each year. And uh, because I'm particularly excited about it or I think of a particularly good idea, I'll say, what do I do? Who do I go to? Do I go to the speaker and say, I think this is a corrections bill, not just a regular, one of my regular good bills, but a, a corrections bill. In either case, the bill has to go through the relevant committee and come out the other end, you know, eventually. And then at that point, the speaker, if he remembers about it or I remind him, can take that, pluck that bill from the regular calendar and put it on the corrections calendar. But what happens meanwhile? Does the committee have to, to, to deal with it in any different kind of way? Or no. there, it can just get lost in committee. There's no necessary I process. I don't see getting that. lost. Uh, what, what we're going to do, they will be referred to three of us. Uh, it then gets, goes through that process. It goes through the committee process. Uh, it's very carefully on track. It's on a fast track. Uh, the, the speaker puts his approval on it, and it comes uh, and it gets put on the calendar. But Bill, none and of this so is in the rule. Get lost. None of this is in the proposed no, rules. No, but it's change. in the existing rules of the House. Tony, if I might no. just interject Look, if for I, one minute, may, may I? Of course. Uh, right now, if uh, if a rule, if a bill is introduced by Mr. Zellif or Mr. McIntosh right. or you, uh, it goes to a committee of jurisdiction. Right. That committee of jurisdiction, under the rules of the House, will uh, mark up that uh, that bill. Then it can either go, uh, the Speaker has the prerogative under the rules of the House existing rules to place that bill on a suspension calendar if he wants to. Right. Or he would have the, uh, the uh, prerogative of uh, designating it to go on the corrections calendar. Or it can come to this Rules Committee and this Rules Committee can put out a special rule. Those are the rules of the House. What the Speaker really wants to do here uh, is to focus try to, and that is a part of this whole corrections uh, formula, is to try to focus the country and this Congress on the silly rules and regulations that, that we feel are silly, and, and to do it through this corrections process, and thereby attract attention of the press, uh, and accumulate these, and uh, try to send a message to the bureaucracy. Look, That's the whole idea Mr. behind it. I understand all that, and I won't... I don't mean to be argumentative, and I won't ask any more questions at this point. But in a sense, I suppose you could say that about all the bills that came out in your contract with America. They were to clean up regulations in general that didn't make sense or to whatever it was. I mean, they were, they, they were an attempt to, to make changes in existing laws, to make them, from the point of view at least of the new majority, um, more sensible or more effective or efficient than the old laws. Complex. Mr. Chairman, well, you, but, you're, but, but complexity is not one of the criteria here. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm lost, that's all. I don't mean, you know, I wish I weren't on this because I don't, you still have to go through a committee process. A committee still would have the, would be able to mark up or not mark up to, to consider or not consider these bills, even as they do now. I mean, the vast majority of bills which are introduced each year are introduced and you never hear about them again. Um, and here it seems to me the speaker only has some kind of authority at the end of the process after a bill has been reported by a committee. He can then grab that bill and put it on a new corrections calendar instead of one of the other corrections calendar. But, but there's calendars. But there's nothing else in the, in the meanwhile. Are you, are you also saying, Bill, that somehow if, if, if we believe ourselves upon the introduction of a bill that it ought to be a candidate for corrections that we come to you three, are you going to be the group? And you'll tell, I mean, it's just you three, nobody else, it's not a bipartisan group. We and will, you'll decide which bills should be corrections bills. We will, there... It'll be evaluated as to whether it meets the criteria to, to be put on the corrections uh, process. And then, uh, then it gets assigned and, and put through the committee process. At what, pardon me, sure. at what stage does it come to you? If you have an idea, yeah. you present it to us or our staff, and we start oh. the process moving. Yeah. I mean, it's Is that before it goes to committee? Or before after? it goes to committee. If you, if, if you have a recommendation or an idea, you present it, we'll put it into the process through, through the committee that's been set up. Do you also get referral on these? We don't do that. Well, everything is going to go through this. Oh, well, committee is well, no, 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 we're not, we're not doing it. Well, okay, yeah. I'll stop at this point, Mr. Chairman, only to, but I will just in closing point out that as far as I can tell in reading this, the, the proposed resolution, proposed rules change, there's nothing about what the gentleman is just speaking about that's included in here, that nothing kicks in. There's no change in the rules until, as I quote again, after a bill has been favorably reported and placed on either calendar. So there's no process provided for in the proposed rule change similar to what's being mentioned by Mr. Zeller. Well, the gentleman is, uh, if I might again, the gentleman is absolutely correct. 
and um, the uh, the speaker has the prerogative to carry out this rule that we are proposing here. Uh, these two gentlemen and uh, Barbara Vukanovich are simply uh, an advisory group to the speaker. The scoop speaker has several of those. He has an inter uh, uh, advisory group, uh, but uh, certainly uh, they don't carry weight by rule of the house at the present time. And uh, if they were to, uh, if they were to become a referral group as such, uh, that would have to be reflected in the rules of the House. That's not the case here. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. It sounds like we're setting up a super rules committee. <laughs> not at all. I would object to that. <laughs> well, I'm telling you. I mean, just think about it. Think no, about we're, it. We're, we are a group that functions at the request of the Speaker, and we are advisors to the Speaker. Well, so is the rules committee. <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think, you know, the sad thing here, and I think it is sad, here is, a, here is an opportunity and an idea to make this system down here, this bulky system that we have, more efficient. And, you know, we, we, with anything that change, we can come up with a million reasons why not to do anything. Let's just stay the status quo. And, and some people can either accept the change or some people can't. And I hope that there'll be enough people to accept the change that we can move forward and prove to everybody that the intent of the speaker is a bipartisan process that makes sense. To get rid of the dumb things and some of the things that, that, that have happened around here and we clean it up and make it more efficient. And we, we, can, we can make this thing into a big monster or we can try it and make it work. And I'm hopeful that we're going to make it work on both sides of the aisle. Gentlemen, if we, uh, we might, uh, Mr. Bielenson, I hope uh, you're through. We can move on. Uh, Mrs. Price, questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, my questions were kind of in line with Mr. Bielenson's as well as to what role the advisory group would play and at what stage you would enter the process. Uh, and is it more of an informal uh, That's right. advice that you're giving and, and you're giving it to the speaker um, or who? Uh, and I think that is correct. The, the prerogative is the speakers to make referrals to the committees and then after the committees reported to put it on the calendars. And, and in addition to going on the corrections calendar, it goes on the, the regular calendar that it, he would assign it to. And our role is to advise the speaker whether or not a particular bill would be appropriate to go on the corrections calendar. He doesn't have to take the advice. If he doesn't think we're doing a good job, he can pull a different group of people together to get that advice from. Does, and isn't that part of the clerk's job right now to advise the speaker or the parliamentarian or what committee bill to go to? I'll have to tell you, I don't really know. Well, that's going to continue. Oh, we're we're not changing any rule that way. Are you going to add him to the advisory mm -hmm. committee then? <laughs> <laughs> no. And as a matter of, of prudence and moving the process forward, I would recommend to somebody who's sponsoring a Corrections Day legislation that they quickly alert the Speaker's office and, and all the different people involved in it that they have this idea and they're serious about moving it forward and, and then work through the process in the formal, as it's formally put forward in the rules. And the, the process begins, however, with the committee stage. I mean, well, you drop the bill and then it gets referred to committee. Uh, and then you become involved in right. at any time. And it's up to the time. individual's idea, whoever that individual is, to work it through the process, to work it through the committee, and make sure that if he wants, if he or she want, want it to happen, they're going to be responsible for moving forward. Do you know if it's ever the speaker's intention to bypass the committee system at all? I know Mr. Solomon no. has a, a concern it's, about it's, this. From what, from what we know, the intention would be the opposite: to always yeah. make sure the committee is headed. Okay. All right. And I believe that under the uh, the proposed rule that uh, that that would be necessary. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Frost. Well, Chairman, I have really two uh, two questions. Um, first, I'm not sure that that I understand, even though I've heard everybody talking back and forth, um, the role of the minority in this advisory group. Um, Y'all are in the majority right now. You could wind up in the minority two years from now. What we're talking about is a rule of the House, which presumably, if adopted, would then be continued forward in succeeding Congresses. Now, my question is, uh, there's been some discussion about a three-member advisory group. Are there any members of the minority uh, a part of this advisory group? <laughs> there could be. Uh, it is a totally uh, ad hoc uh, advisory group, uh, which is subject to change on a daily basis. Um, as, as I understand it, uh, Speaker Gingrich might uh, might appoint other people to it as well. It's it's not anything that even has to be done through the uh, th through the uh, House structure. 
Uh, but uh, certainly we're open to suggestions from uh, from you. Mr. Bielinson wants to know if we'll uh, we'll consider modifications or changes. Certainly we, uh, we uh, they, will. They, we're going to mark up this bill next Thursday. Yeah, there, there is nothing in the uh, the rule as before mm, us nothing. that provides for this advisory group or for the makeup of the advisory group. That so, is absolutely correct. So assuming that the speaker has an advisory group, he could stu simply have members of his own party in it if he chose to under the rule as written. He could. The speaker is uh, <laughs> is very, very busy. I'll tell you, I don't know how he handles what he does, uh, especially this speaker who is so hands-on. But uh, uh, certainly he's going to have to have help. And uh, he's in pretty good hands with these two gentlemen uh, out front. Well, I, I think his original intent, and, and, and we're not there yet, but as this thing unfolds, I think he's in hopes of expanding the group to more people to include both minority and majority on it, and uh, that's been discussed pretty openly. But uh, this this is a this is the initial process, and uh, and I know he's fully committed to making it to the process that is bipartisan. It has broad general support across the board. That's what this whole thing's all about. Yeah, I have, I have another uh, line of questions. Uh, I just when. Uh, when we were in the majority, uh, I had, from time to time, had the opportunity to help draft uh, rules changes, House rules changes. And uh, I find this one curious in wow. that uh, it doesn't in any way define uh, what legislation is subject to this entire procedure. Uh, we've had a lot of testimony about this, but there's nothing in the rule as written that tells you what legislation is appropriate for this procedure and what legislation is not appropriate for this procedure. Uh, under the, uh, the fourth line on the first page of uh, HRS 161, uh, says 4A, after a bill has been favorably reported, what you're really talking about, after any bill has been favorably reported, right. you don't in any way restrict uh, uh, or narrow uh, the legislation that could be uh, considered under this procedure, as I understand the rule is drafted. Well, I think that's been done on purpose, and it's not, not designed to restrict. It's, it's to, to be very inclusive and, um, and to be fairly wide open. So if a committee were to report a bill repealing OSHA, the speaker could put that on the corrections calendar. Now, that would, of course, require a three-fifths vote, more than the normal majority vote, but it also would uh, severely limit amendments, because the amendments could be but only offered the by, the, by the author. That's not his intent of this legislation. But, the, but you just said a moment ago that the legislation is so broadly drafted that the, any bill could go on the corrections again, calendar. The, the intent of this legislation is to correct the dumbest, most stupid things that this government has done. Well, then why doesn't... And try to make more efficient a, a better process. A I've, heard, process I've, I've heard... Clean up real big messes that have broad... I've, I've heard those words. But I don't think getting rid of OSHA is going to have total broad bipartisan. But, but, but I can think if, a that's your, if that is in fact your intention, why didn't you make any effort to actually define in the rule what, would, what could be considered under this rule? I, I don't understand that. Why, why did you leave it so vague and so broad? I think it was left vague for the reasons I just mentioned before, so that it would be inclusive and it would not be narrow. It want, it, it's an open process, but the, the thing that guides the process is we're looking for legislation uh, or opportunities to correct things that are really dumb, really stupid. Uh, if we went out and took a crowd of any ten people, it's in the eye have, of the, of course, we'd have nine out of ten. That's in the eye support. of the beholder. I mean, there are a lot of people who think the Internal Revenue Code is dumb and stupid. There are a lot of people who think the Superfund... Uh, uh, law well, is dumb fun, and stupid. No, that might be a good idea. <laughs> the gentleman you the, uh, I'm, just, I, I'm just trying to understand why the, the drafters of this legislation, because I have been involved personally in drafting some of the rules of the House in the last uh, 16 years, and I don't understand why there wasn't some more precision or why there wasn't some effort made to actually define what you're talking about in the rule rather than in if conversation. The, uh, if the gentleman would yield, uh, that is the very reason uh, that we insisted on a three-fifths vote. Uh, because if, if something like that should happen, it's going to be subject to a three-fifths vote. Let me again 
uh, read Speaker Gingrich and, and my testimony that uh, uh, of the kind of bills that would be considered under the correction calendar. They should be relatively non-controversial. Now, that doesn't mean non-controversial because any rule that's out there probably has some supporters, so there's going to be some controversy. But relatively non-controversial should be confined to a single subject. Now, that means no complex legislation. Should not involve the expenditure of additional monies or the raising of additional revenues. Should be reported by the Committee of Jurisdiction so that members will have the benefit of a report okay, to allow them to make fully informed decisions. Well, and I, I could go on with this, Ms. and I'll Mr. ask Chairman, unanimous consent to submit this for the record. Mr. Chairman, why, isn't that, why doesn't that language that you just read actually appear in the rule, then? If that's, your, if that's your clear intention, why not put it in the rule? For the same reason it doesn't appear in the suspension calendar rules now. Uh, with the three-fifths vote, I personally feel that we are protected. We had, Marty, I will say we had members that wanted to actually have a corrections calendar with a simple majority vote. And I objected to that. To me, that would be giving up our uh, authority here in the Rules Committee. It would be allowing closed rules to go directly to the floor without even uh, having the, uh, the input from this committee itself. Well, in fact, uh, what you have is a closed rule uh, under, this, under this proposal. It does require a three-fifths vote, but it is a closed rule because the only, amendments yeah. so that can be made, the only amendments that can be made in order are those offered by the chairman of the committee. And suspension bills are the same. Oh, I understand, but, you, but you're, you're, you're lowering the threshold by about 30 votes uh, by going from uh, uh, two-thirds down to three-fifths. You're right. making it easier uh, to handle something under a closed procedure. And I just, uh, I just don't understand. I think there's a lot of support for what you're trying to do. I'm not suggesting there isn't. I don't understand why, why you don't feel the need to be more precise in the rule because some of the reasons we have been uh, criticized over the years, uh, remember when we were in the majority, uh, for not being precise and not being definite in terms of uh, proposals that we presented to Congress. And I, that's a legitimate criticism, quite frankly. And I, I think uh, members of Congress and uh, the public in general uh, have certainly have a need to understand what we're talking about and what we contemplate uh, rather than just having a testimony to that effect. Um, the, the rule is very short. It's just it's less than two pages. It seems like y'all could put a little paragraph in there saying what you're talking about. May I? With the gentleman, the, uh, just one quick yes. moment. May I ask one quick question? Certainly. Sort of in the other direction. Why, why would we want a, a bill that's designed to correct a truly stupid truly foolish and dumb thing to need a three-fifths vote. Why not just a majority vote? I mean, if I, you know, if I think there's something really stupid out there, I introduce a bill to change it, why make me get three-fifths vote? Why not a majority vote? Why not do it through our regular process, in other words? It didn't take three-fifths to put it on. Hmm. You, you would be doing it under a closed rule, Tony. Yeah, but, but why do it under a closed rule? Why not, look, there's something truly stupid out there. That's some regulations. Why not do it under a regular bill? Just require a majority vote. Why not allow some amendments on the floor to clean it up? Because it will be more complex than people suspect. In other words, why not stick with the existing legislative process, but put some bills, you know, if one wants to highlight them, on something called a corrections calendar, whether it's a regular calendar, whether it's a, a suspension calendar or something else. Why go through this? Because it raises so we many broad, questions that nobody can answer. We want broad bipartisan support. It should be now. It should be able to pass the full house. Have significant outside support. But, but as Mr. Bill, my, support. Bill, as my friend points out, that's not in the rule. You didn't put that in the rule. That's only if, it's if not I required. And there's no and there's no mechanism provided in the rule yeah. or even outside the well, rule to require any kind if of I could bipartisan reclaim input. My input time, gentlemen, uh, uh, we're going to have to move if on. If I could reclaim Mr. Frost it, uh, has the time. I mean, I. Clearly, there's some examples that come to mind. Um, I don't know, Jerry, if you remember, Mr. Chairman, if you remember, but uh, a number of years ago, um, somebody, I guess it was the EPA, uh, issued a regulation defining uh, drilling mud used to drill oil wells as hazardous waste. I mean, that was clearly within your definition. Ludicrous. Stupid, crazy, <laughs> ludicrous. Um, and we ultimately attached an amendment uh, to a bill that was working its way through Congress, and we got that regulation changed. Uh, you may remember that there was, uh, when we, the Brady Bill passed, uh, somebody in, the, in one of the federal agencies uh, decided that uh, if someone pawned tried to redeem his weapon, uh, that he had pawned his own weapon, that there had to be a background check. That was never contemplated uh, when the Brady Bill was passed, and in fact, it took a, it took a lot of doing, but ultimately, we repealed that regulation. Uh, again, attaching it to another piece of legislation coming through. So there are lots of good examples of what you're talking about. 
that uh, uh, we need to repeal some more of these. But I just wish as a legislator and as a member of this committee um, that has the obligation for writing the rules of the House that we could be a little more precise when we're writing rules of the House. The gentleman's points are always well taken. Mr. McGinnis from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, I think that the idea is an excellent idea. I think that the only way we're going to get it done is to do exactly what you're doing, and that is come up with an idea and push that idea forward. I think it's very positive. I think you're moving in the right direction. And with respect to my friend from the fine state of Texas, I realize that there are some examples you can show of excessive regulation that were taken care of. But I think for every one that you can demonstrate, we could probably show you 50 to 100 in that type of multiple of regulations that still exist. If the ship, the, the, I won't yield. The, the ship has not left the dock. And despite the status quo, it's still not moving. At least this proposal is going to get the ship out to open sea, and we can dispute or argue about the direction of it. Now I'll yield to the gentleman. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting that there weren't things that, uh, that couldn't be done under this procedure. I don't have any problem with this procedure. I would like us to be a little more precise in crafting the procedure. I wasn't suggesting that you had to do it through the old way. Well, well I'm the reclaiming my time. Amendments when we, when we mark up, I'd be interested in seeing what, uh, what his thoughts are. And reclaiming my time, uh, I'm not sure, Mr. Frost, that we're ever going to get it precise enough to satisfy everybody. At some point, we need to move forward. We got There's so many people that have looked at the ship, they've just given up on it. They think it's just going to sink at the dock. Let's get it going. We can get it out to sea. We can fine-tune it, but it is going the general direction. Both of us agree with that. And I think uh, I can't offer anything but solid, strong encouragement to the work you're doing. Let's move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Waldo, I'm sorry, Mr. McIntosh. If, if I could just interject, one, one of the things that I observed actually before joining Congress was that those type of correction amendments generally were husbanded in the committees until you had a larger bill that went through and could be brought to the floor. And one of the objectives here is to bring them out more frequently in, as individual items so that you don't have to wait for that to happen in order to correct the, the more obvious problems that go on. Would you like to tell us what you did in your former life? Well, I worked with Vice President Quayle at the Council on Competitiveness in trying to correct regulations on the executive side. So he's a great guy. He didn't mind having older men around then, I see. Pardon? He didn't mind having older men like you around. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, with gray hair. Uh, Danny Quayle will always be young at heart. Mrs. Walholtz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me apologize for being late. Uh, it was Utah's turn to testify in front of the BRAC commissioners, and I came oh, over boy. as soon as we were we were finished. Uh, but while I wasn't here for your testimony, I have followed your work on this issue with great interest. I, I think the point is, is that we're trying to come up with a procedure where you don't have to attach it to another unrelated bill, that you don't have to wait until you can piggyback it onto something that is unrelated to what we're dealing with, but that we have an opportunity when we identify a problem to deal with it quickly, to deal with it on that one area without having to lump everything together, as I think a lot of our constituents have correctly criticized us for. Uh, it, it shouldn't take having to piggyback uh, repeal of some regulation onto a completely unrelated bill simply because we don't have a procedure for dealing expeditiously with things we recognize as problems. And so I support what you're doing. Uh, it seems to me that we ought to be able to come up with some mechanism. Uh, if, if we need to clarify things a little bit more precisely, we ought to be able to do that. But let's not sink this procedure that I think will finally let us deal uh, in a timely way with problems that occur instead of making people live with it until we have time to get around to changing it. Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Buckley, you have a question? Yeah, Did I, you wish the general lady to yield? No, I, uh, but uh, in the general subject, I don't think there's anybody on this side that disagrees Would you, would you turn with on your microphone, please, sir? You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that anybody on this side of the aisle disagrees with what you say or uh, what Mr. McGinnis said. Uh, we want something to go out there, but We've got a bill here that doesn't set up an advisory commission, but yet we're told by these people there's an advisory commission set up. Uh, who's on the commission? Well, the, the three Republican members. Now, you're talking about bipartisanship. Uh, you know, I just think that right off the, the, the bat, you, you violate it. And then you make up what is necessary to, uh, for a bill to be under the correction bill. It's got to be silly. It's got to be ludicrous. And 
as I said, uh, you know, I've spent weeks in courts uh, discussing what is reasonable. So when you come to silly and ludicrous and stupid, you know, I'm sure there are more dictionaries that could be written on that. So I would love to be able, if, if you could, uh, just allow the ranking minority member to have a sign off or something as simple as that. We're not trying to stop the ship. I think it's a great idea. But I think it has to be refined. And I just think the testimony has so much more than the bill has. The, the bill is uh, it's conspicuous by its absence, practically. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> we have one more uh, quick comment that I think, uh, go ahead. Well, it's my understanding, Mr. Moakley, that, that the speaker either has or is intending, and I think has, uh, talked with Mr. Gephardt about his suggestions for the advisory committee, and, and I think and I think probably that's where uh, that's where there may be a delay at this point. And I think that that, that the speaker has made a total commitment to working bipartisan. Um, I think that you'll see that the, that the committee will will include uh, minority members, and I think if we give it a chance, the process will work. And uh, I think I think you know we've got to be open to change in this place, and I think that's one of our problems. And if we do it, we do it right the way the speaker wants to do it. I think you'd be very happy with it. I would hate like Kelly come back here next year and have this bill the first one on the corrections committee thing to get rid of. Well, without uh, well, without belaboring this too. point, uh, you know the truth is that uh, Speaker Gingrich uh, did make overtures to the uh, uh, to the Democrat side of the aisle. Uh, the, uh, there was objections by uh, the, the Democrat leadership uh, to appointing conservative Democrats to the to the committee, and of course they are the ones that uh, that really want to have the input. So this is really uh, the crux of the problem. That's why it's ad hoc the way it is now. I'm sure it'll get itself worked out. May I uh, at this time yield to Porter Goss, who was detained at another committee meeting and was unable to get here for the Thank earlier you. testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I had to leave temporarily, and it seems the conversation is about the same place. So I, <laughs> I think, that, uh, think that I understand this legislation. I, I just finished a book called The Death of Common Sense. A lot of people have read by uh, mm. Philip Howard. And it, it is a, it's a fabulous book. And I, I suspect that what you're doing is creating a procedure to try and resurrect some common sense. And I congratulate you for doing that. The objections that I've heard, I think, are part of the philosophy that we espouse, which is flexibility and less government. I don't want one of these things that's a cookbook that tells me exactly how to do every step. I think this is the opportunity for us collectively on a nonpartisan, bipartisan basis to uh, identify what's wrong and try and find a simple procedure to get it uh, excised rather quickly. And I congratulate you. I think that Mr. Moakley's comment about uh, the concern about this uh, informal advisory arrangement that's going to go on with the speaker. Uh, I guess a lot of people have the speaker's ears, whichever party, whichever time and moment, the speaker is the speaker. That'll always be the case. But I don't believe there's any attempt at all in any of the procedure to say that any member of any party Republican, Democrat, or any other party uh, who thinks it's something silly, stupid, ludicrous, or in, in his dictionary judgment, uh, not necessary any longer, uh, has the right to try and submit this uh, into this process. And so I think in that sense, it's very wide open. Uh, and I think, as in all things, the majority eventually controls what goes on the floor. And I think that's right, too. So I think what we're doing is creating a flexible, speedier process that's fair, that's going to allow us to focus on some of the nonsense that the people of this country have said, why don't you get rid of some of these things and we'll have a little more confidence in our government. And I, you know, that's, it seems simple, but that's the way I see it. Am I wrong? Thank you. That said so well. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, I, we appreciate you staying so long for all of the questions. We appreciate the good work you've done, and uh, uh, come back and see us soon. How does this Thank affect you. the A to Z amendment at the <laughs> Well, see, the, the A to Z would, would have bypassed the committee process, and we learned so much from that process. We're trying very hard to make this go through the committee process, make sure everybody has a chance to, in a nonpartisan way, to work together, holding hands to get it done right, to make this place more efficient, put back in common sense, and God bless America and the American flag, and you too. <laughs> We got my vote. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> the uh, next uh, next panel uh, will be made up of uh, two very distinguished uh, members of this Congress, uh, the Honorable John Dingle and the Honorable Curtis Collins. If you both uh, would come forward. <laughs> Mrs. Collins, did you want age to go before beauty, or did you... Wisdom, like before <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> wisdom before non-wisdom. Wisdom before non-wisdom. 
John. I would uh, like to welcome you both before the committee. We hope you will summarize and your entire statement will appear in the record. Uh, and uh, John Dingle, uh, one of the longest serving members of this body and one of the most respected. Uh, what wisdom do you have for us, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I ask you now to my record. My Without objection. Be inserted in the record. Mr. Chairman, this is the most peculiar rule. And I, I, I say so with great respect for you and, and the members of this committee. If you look at it, it is touted as something which will be used for the handling only of relatively non-controversial legislation. I see nothing of that kind in there, which says that it will be applied only to non-controversial legislation. We have a process which is virtually identical for the dealing with non-controversial legislation. That's the suspension process. The difference between this and the suspension process is the suspension requires two-thirds, uh, whereas this requires three-fifths. Uh, amendments are allowed under this process, but only where were suggested by the committee, and only where, uh, or only when, when uh, pushed by the chairman of the committee, who uh, is handling the particular legislation. Uh, the question then is, why is this proposal brought before us? Uh, suspension does waive points of order. The proposal does not. Uh, the difference between this and the other difference between this and suspension is that bills must be favorably reported. But none of that says that there's any real significant changes in the rules with regard to this proposal other than the, than the absolute number of votes or the percentage of the members voting what must be reduced from 290 to 261 or from 66 and two-thirds or two-thirds of, of, of the members down to 60% or three-fifths. Now, the, there have been a lot of things suggested that there would be an advisory panel. I've looked in vain to see if there's an advisory panel. And I've tried to understand what would be the constraints that would be imposed on the speaker in putting a bill of this kind on the suspension. I've also looked to see how it could be done. First of all, the speaker could put any bill, and I assume a bill is, is used in, 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 in reference to the rules which relate to bills as opposed to resolutions. But that means, for example, that the reconciliation package could be put on there. The, uh, the, uh, the, any, any major piece of legislation, including a piece of legislation which would abolish, for example, Department of Energy, Department of uh, Health and Human <coughs> Services, or the uh, <coughs> Department of Defense, or the Department of uh, Education, or the Department of Housing and Urban Development. There's, there's literally no limit to the legislation which could be brought to the floor. Now, the requirement of for three days layover, I assume, is, is from other legislation because I find, or rather from other parts of the rules, because I find nothing in this rule which, which says that the bill has to lay over three days. So the bill is reported out by a committee. It's put on the, it's put on the calendar by the, by the speaker the day it comes out. Uh, the, there, there are specific times when it has to come up, but by carefully, by, by careful managing of the legislation, the bill could be on the floor three days after, three legislative days after it was put on the calendar. That could mean that a piece of legislation of some of the most intense controversy and controversial character would be put on the floor with a requirement for a three-fifths vote three days after, after it had been put on the calendar, or probably three or four days after it had been reported out of a committee which means virtually no notice. There would be no provision for amendment excepting that which was, which was done by the direction of the committee or done by the direction of the chairman of the committee. The minority would have absolutely no say. Now, I would remind this committee that, that from time to time, there are more than three-fifths of, of the members of this body under one, under one party. Uh, and so that would mean that, that three-fifths would then be able to simply say, okay, in caucus, we're going to pass this bill without amendment. We pass a bill without amendment. 
It means a major piece of legislation. There's nothing, and I remind you, there's nothing in this legislation, or rather in this rule, which says that it does not need, to, that, that it has to be of a, a, a relatively non-controversial character. It could be the most intensely controversial. And it could be, as I mentioned, anything up to and including the rescission bill, or a bill abolishing a, a cabinet agency, or a bill relating to uh, crime, or gun control, or habeas corpus, or whatever it might happen to be that, that, that you would want. Uh, and and, and the, those opposed to the bill, whether they were bipartisan in character or otherwise, would have no opportunity to amend. The vote would be simply a yes or no vote. And the bill would then pass and, and would, 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 would go to the, to the Senate or to the President for signature. If it passed the Senate already, it could be, it could be larped through here uh, without, without any debate or any opportunity or any notice. So I think that you are beginning to see that this is something which duplicates existing processes and procedures. It's something which, which reduces the absolute number of votes which have to be achieved to pass a bill under a gag rule. It is a, it is a proposal which, uh, which raises questions as to who or why uh, we are presented, uh, by whom or why we are presented with this. Does it come from the speaker's office? I've heard speakers saying you wanted it. Uh, and I, I want to commend our freshman members. They are always of great enthusiasm. And I remember years ago when I was a freshman, I was a member of enormous enthusiasm. And I wanted to reform not only the Congress, but the whole bloody world. Uh, and I'm happy to report to you that, that my senior colleagues did not permit me to do that. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to report to you because of the embarrassment that it saved me. Uh, and I think sometimes senior members have to say, well, we need to take a little bit of a look at this thing just so that we don't make fools of ourselves and so that we don't trample on, on, on the orderly processing of, of, of this legislation. <coughs> now, you might think I'm making a plea specifically for the minority. I'm not. I'm simply making a plea for good legislative practice. I think <coughs> that, the, that the rough and tumble debate and discussion which takes place on the floor serves a very useful purpose. It permits the members to, to discuss and to amend and to decide whether a piece of legislation is good. And whether the amendment carries or not, oft times the discussion of it confers a significant benefit on the members in terms of making up their mind as to whether this is good legislation or whether or not some other change in the legislation might well be in order. Or whether or not there's something else we ought to do that we cannot do under the rules and process of the House. So I would urge you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, consider this very carefully. This looks awfully good. It doesn't do anything that the suspension calendar doesn't do, except to, to further gag uh, members who might not, might not fall into the, into the number who would be willing to vote for a piece of legislation. It stultifies the rights of members to offer amendment. It curtails the right of debate and discussion in this institution. And after all, we are supposed to be a deliberative body. I know that that's become unpopular in the haste to, to, to do whatever might happen to be, appear to be convenient or necessary to do without proper consideration of, of, of the broadest possible contribution by members from all parts of the country and from all parts of the political spectrum. So I would urge, Mr. Chairman, that, 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 that this is something which, very frankly, in its current state, should be rejected. It leads too much to speculation as to what it would do. But a little bit of intelligent speculation will tell you that this proposal offers you great opportunity for mischief. And quite frankly, it affords enormous opportunity to denigrate this committee. Because this committee is, after all, a rules committee. You can report out closed rules, and, and, and you do very frequently, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I would, and I, would, I would, yes, you do. And I would remind you, Mr. Chairman, that, that in the years that I have been, to, been before this committee, and there have been many, I have never once suggested that we have a closed rule. I've always felt that, that, that the broadest kind of debate served the best interest of this body. And I'm here to take that same position today. I believe it's in the interest of this body, in the interest of this committee, it's in the interest of, of the Congress, it's in the interest of every member of the body. I urge you to reject this. It's an unwise piece of legislation. John, we appreciate your testimony. Mrs. Uh, Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to testify before you today. As you know, we did have a joint, uh, a joint hearing before the, the uh, Government Reform and Oversight Committee and this Rules Committee. And, and during that time, we, uh, most of us felt that some kind of corrections procedure might, be, might serve a useful purpose if it were handled correctly and properly. Unfortunately, HRES 161 would actually rig the playing field for the majority. 
would give you an, a, 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 an advantage that uh, I don't think that you really need for a supposedly non-controversial bill. I mean, you've already passed the, the uh, contract with, with America uh, without rigging any more rules, and this very committee itself you know, reported these rules and recognized that new House rules were not needed to allow the majority to work as well on that enormous piece of legislation that you did. Uh, the thing that I I'm most concerned about is the fact that um, this resolution would allow the corrections bills to go to the floor at the sole discretion of the Speaker under rules that would permit no amendments at all and require two-thirds vote. First of all, if a bill can pass the House by three-fifths, if a bill can pass the House by two-thirds, why not correct it by two-thirds? It just seems to, to do so. The implication then becomes that you have counted the, the, the number of votes that we got on the, that you got on the uh, contract with America and found that most of those votes were three-fifths votes and therefore you want to make three-fifths votes in order to, to um, uh, correct something. Mr. McIntosh said here that, well, three-fifths is what they do over in the Senate. We're not talking about Senate rules. We're talking about House rules. That's why we're here today to talk about it's House rules. And it doesn't relate to debate whatsoever. Uh, another point that I wanted to make is that I heard this discussion of what's supposed to be a correction. Uh, there's no real definition of what a correction is going to be. I mean, I've heard all these terms, and everything I heard was as, amb as ambiguous as Mr. Zellif called stupid and this and that and the other thing. There needs to be a hard definition of what a correction is going to be so that we all are on the same playing field. It seems to me that if any person can say, I want this corrected because something's happening in my district that I don't like, you don't have a real concrete uh, reason for doing anything with legislation. Somebody could not only uh, decide that they don't need a whole bureaucracy, that they don't need a whole uh, department, they could say they don't need a specific act. They could decide they don't need the Voting Rights Act, for example, which would cause a great deal of unfairness and harm in this country. That's a major concern that I would have. Now, another thing that I'm concerned about is this advisory council that I've been listening to here for the last year. I mean, for the last uh, hour or so. It seemed like a year. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, here you have this advisory council as is now constituted of three people who are in the majority. There is no minority at this time. I have been under the impression that the speaker has asked the minority leader uh, perhaps for some names of people to go on an advisory council, but that he holds a veto over who those people might be. Now there is something amiss there if ever there was a, a bipartisan way. But an advisory committee as I see it could function as a very special group, uh, a very special group for special interests that don't want to have their concerns explained to the public at large and in an open view of everybody. They would go to such a group as that, as they did under the competitive council that uh, was chaired by Vice President uh, count, uh, Quayle that Mr. McIntosh referred to and did these things in the blind of the cover of secrecy. I don't think that's what we want in this Congress. At least that was the impression that I had when the 104th Congress began. These are all issues that I feel are extremely important and things we ought to do. Now somebody says we haven't even seen a list. Well, we have seen a list, as you know. There was a list passed around at the hearing I'm referring to of the Government Reform Committee and the Rules Committee, and some of the things that were on the so-called corrections inventory that nobody seemed to know where it came from were very important things like fish and wildlife, back pay, life, wildlife access, defense logistics surplus, DOD property, um, Federal Highway Administration, Public Law 100-418, um, private pension law reform, Individuals with Disability Act revision, and three or four things under that. Those are very important pieces of legislation that help American citizens. Mrs. 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 Collins, country, uh, without objection for the record, would you submit that for the record for us? Well, here it is right here. Oh, thank you. Yes, indeed. I'd be more than okay. happy to. Good. So those are the concerns that I have, Mr. Chairman. I think there are valid concerns from others that I've heard here. They're very serious about perhaps there's a need for some kind of corrections procedure if done properly. The key is if done properly, and I would add, and fairly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, to uh, both of you, uh, both highly respected members of this body, uh, by me personally and by, I think, the whole body, you are held in, in high esteem. Uh, let me just respond uh, briefly uh, uh, to the uh, question of the advisory committee, because there is no advisory committee as such nor is there currently under House rules on the suspension calendar either. 
uh, right now that is up to these to the speaker uh, be Republican or Democrat to uh, uh, select bills if he wishes and put them on the bill together he does uh, at least we do and I assume that the uh, Democrat speaker before him did uh, he does consult with the minority and uh, certainly uh, I, I know that Speaker Gingrich would do this there is the possibility that uh, there could be a more uh, uh, permanent uh, kind of advisory committee uh, in which case uh, it could be made up of both parties uh, and I think that's under consideration too that is not a part of this legislation uh, that is a, before us here my good friend John Dingle mentioned that um, that any bill uh, reconciliation bills or whatever could be brought up uh, on the uh, uh, the uh, corrections calendar and and that's true but that's true of the suspension calendar today uh, I've just had the uh, the Judiciary Committee report my constitutional amendment that would give the the uh, power to the states to uh, ban the desecration, physical desecration of the American flag. I have the choice right now of bringing that up under suspension if I want to. That's a closed rule, I suppose. Yeah. But um, I don't think I'm going to do that. I think we're going to come to the Rules Committee. But um, um, at any rate, uh, there are differences between the suspension calendar and what we would attempt to do here. I would oppose. Uh, as I did when there were suggestions that uh, that we bring these bills to a uh, to a uh, to the floor on a corrections calendar with a simple majority vote, I think that would be wrong. Then that would really be uh, bypassing the committee system. It would really be bypassing this rules committee, and uh, and we did object to it. But nevertheless, your points are well taken, and uh, certainly uh, when it comes time to mark up this, uh, this rules change on uh, Thursday, I believe in the afternoon, uh, I think Mr. Mokley will certainly uh, entertain your suggestions and perhaps even offer amendments uh, along those lines. Could I make an observation yes. in response to your Absolutely, comments? John. As you know, we've been friends a long time. Absolutely. And I have enormous respect for you. And although we differ in uh, art swords points occasionally professionally, I've always thought you're one of the really great members of this institution. But well, let's look at this. Un under, under suspension, you'd need a two-thirds vote. Under this, you'd need a three-fifths vote. Under suspension, there would be there would be no amendments. Under this, for practical purposes, there would be no amendments. Under suspension, the, the chairman of the committee could change the bill before he brought it to the floor. Points of order would be waived. But a, three, uh, but a two thirds vote would be required as opposed to three fifths. Fairly easy to get a three fifths vote. And the issue here really is are you going to afford, how, how frequently are you going to afford right to deny members who are not members of the committee in question? to offer amendments or to participate in the debate. You're only going to give one hour under this thing. That means under the best of circumstances, you might have three or four members on each side having a reasonably intelligent opportunity to make a presentation. Under, under the, uh, under, and if you look at the way things go on suspension, you'll find it's enormously difficult for anybody to have any kind of intelligence say. You have a parade of people who have half a minute or a minute or two minutes maybe, which is not time enough for a really intelligent presentation of some of the important points that go on on this. And I, I, I reiterate, it's fairly easy with a, with a vote of 260, 261, which we require here, to come up with the necessary number of votes. I don't think that I don't think that it's good. Now, if you want to use the suspension calendar for this, there are very easy ways to do. I would remind you, first of all, during the days that I was a committee chairman, we always had the very the, 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 the practice that we always consulted with our minority member. I never once came 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 to the floor with a suspension without having consulted with with the senior Republican member of the committee, and they, they'll tell you that that's so. Second of all, we always consulted with, with the Republican leadership. We never, I never brought anything to the floor without consulting either with Bob Michael or Jim Gingrich because, because I didn't think that it was good sense. And uh, that's the way it should be. That's, that's the way it should be. There's really, there's, there was no requirement, but we did it. Under this, the discipline which, which really enforced that is removed because all you got to do is have three fifths, not two thirds. Two thirds is difficult to get. And remember, you are. To, in, in, in both the suspension of the rules, which by its very names means you're suspending the rules and you're functioning under a very peculiarly limited process. And under this process, you are, you are using virtually the same mechanism. Uh, so you are, you are not affording opportunity for amendment, you're not affording a, a amendment, you're not affording opportunity for adequate and intelligent discussion. Uh, and, and you're denying the House, you're denying the people of this country 
the opportunity to have their to, to have their elected representative be heard or to offer amendments on matters which are important. I cannot believe that any member who would call himself conservative would look at the idea that this is the way that this thing should be done. A conservative wants to preserve and to protect values. And it, it, it is peculiar for me to consider myself now becoming a conservative in an institution which I, which I, which I have, uh, can't any more well define. But protecting old values is an important thing. Protecting free debate in this institution is an important thing. Protecting the right of members to amend. If you are really determined to have this kind of process, let's use the suspension mechanism. It only requires two-thirds. You bring it up the same day, the speaker says, okay, we're going to put these bills on under the suspension mechanism. The only difference, the only real difference as a practical matter is that you get a two-thirds vote. But at least in that, you are then comfortable that in, in, in the achieving of that vote, there are going to be disciplines which are going to present, or which are going to prevent excesses by a small majority uh, and, 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 and the cutting of backroom deals to, to, to present this Congress with what is essentially a, 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 a glorious gag rule which permits no discussion, no intelligent discussion, and no, and no amendment. So I, there, there are alternatives to this which will work every bit as well, which will be fair. They're in the existing rules. They, you need not go into this strange and peculiar thing, which has, which, which denies you in the rules committee the opportunity to carry out your necessary business and, and your very important business, but which denies the members the opportunity to, to properly participate, and which has a lot of things like an advisory a panel, a discussion about who and what legislation is going to come up and all that sort of thing. I, I, I just say, Mr. Chairman, you, you are treading on dangerous ground here, and I would say you'd be very careful about, about moving this process forward. Well, John, you know I'm a great defender of the uh, committee system in this Congress. And uh, if I thought for one minute that uh, the uh, any other bills other than non-controversial single-subject bills would be brought up, uh, uh, I certainly wouldn't be supporting this legislation. I'm just uh, concerned. You know what happens with Glass-Steagall. You know what happens with uh, the telecommunications bill. Uh, sometimes when you get bogged down with, um, with uh, these kind of uh, complex issues, they never get to the floor. We want to bring these to the floor. Okay, we want to focus me, on them. Let me remind you, Mr. Chairman, the telecommunications bill is moving. Let me remind After you, years. Glass-Steagall Glass legislation is moving. And let me also remind you that the reason Glass-Steagall has not moved has been because it did not pass the sniff test. In other Congresses, it wasn't, it wasn't John Dingell that killed Glass Dingell. It was simply the fact that everybody recognized that you can't trust bankers with more than a certain amount of power without an awful lot of supervision because they, because under, under a repeal, uh, because of Glass Dingell's repeal, bankers would have the wonderful opportunity to play, play games with, with, with their depositors' money and expect the taxpayers to make them whole through the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Mr. Porter Goss, what do you think of all this? I uh, think you've made your points very well, Mr. Dinglish, usually, and Ms. Collins, thank you. They, it's, it comes down to very simply 29 votes uh, and consulting with a minority, if I've listened closely to what you've said. 29 votes is a large number, I remember. I mean, that's, that's the issue that you've raised uh, for our attention. Uh, it's one of the issues. Uh, Plus the consulting with a minority. It remember, it's the difference closer. between 261 and 290. If you say t just 29 votes, it doesn't sound like much. Mm. But the difference between 261 and 290 is very large. Well, I would, I would agree that there is a difference of 29 votes there with you. Um, I, I would also point out there is a larger difference between 218 and 261. And it seems to me that the concern you have uh, about a manager of a proposition that was highly controversial getting hung up uh, has got a better chance uh, going through uh, under the normal system and the people would be well advised to use the system, the regular committee system and taking their chances and going for the 218 rather than running the risk of using a procedure like this which is really designed for a narrow issue, one narrow issue. Let me remind you of a couple things. First of all, this, this place is supposed to run on simple majorities. That was the idea of the, of the, of the founding fathers of the, in the Constitution that the majority rule. Now, and, and when you pass something by 218, at least in theory, you've had an opportunity for an intelligent, reasonably extended debate. I don't mean I don't mean filibuster or anything, but just a reasonable opportunity to discuss. And you've also had a reason 
reasonable opportunity, if the Rules Committee hasn't been over enthusiastic, <laughs> you've had a reasonable opportunity to amend the bill. And what's the suspension says it says with two thirds you can do any damn thing you want. And that's probably that's probably good. What this what this proposal says, with three fifths you can do any damn thing you want. And I, I think that to, to, to say with three fifths you can do any damn thing to, you want is really getting away from what the founding fathers intended, and that is that we should function on the basis of a majority, but on the basis of intelligent debate and opportunity to amend. That is not in this process. As, as I said earlier, I think we're trying to keep the process simple and narrow for corrections is the idea. And uh, that is why we're looking for that process. I appreciate your comments. I think we have some disagreement on some points, but I think your wisdom is good wisdom and always has been and served the institution well for many years. Thank you. The real question was, why do you need this? I, I, had, I had a bunch of, my good friend, the chairman mentioned, uh, Stigall, I had a bunch of bankers in, into a hearing. And I said, what well, now, in 25 words or less, why do you want this? Well, there's an old statement that says, May I ask you, in 25 words or less, why do you or the other proponents of this legislation want this want this change? There must be some reason. What is it? It's very simple. In, in, in the world of the old saw, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. But unfortunately, everybody in America knows we've got some laws that need improvement and some things that are just plain um, devoid of any sense at all. So we're trying to divine a fairly uh, easy, quick way that will pass muster in public, in the sunshine, to fix it. Well, so this is a fix-it bill. There ain't going to be much sunshine in the process that you're describing. And you, ought not, and you ought not either deceive yourself or try to deceive anybody else into believing that, that, that this is going to be a process which is going to be fraught with sunshine. First of all, the notice is so brief as to allow the thing come up about four days after it comes out of committee. Uh, and 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 in in in, 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 a, in in a committee which is run by somebody who really wants to do it with, with with the majority, that bill can come out of that committee in just minutes of time. Believe me. Uh, and and so there will be no debate. And and if, if you call one hour of discussion sunshine, your your ideas about sunshine are, don't reflect your experience in Florida. Well, it's where they, have, where, where they really believe that sunshine is supposed to be all day and not just every once in a while for a period of an hour. Well, we don't believe in periods of bright. That's the British system. We have full sunshine in Florida, and, and I would suspect that an hour debate is full sunshine. I realize I'm getting past my time, but an hour is more than 20 minutes. At least we've accomplished that. And you've got 435 members of this place who, who may very well want to talk. But this has gone through the committee system. Gentlemen, no, the, I use uh, my time. It seems the, uh, the, the sun is setting. And uh, yeah. before it does, I'd like to recognize so Mr. Moakley. Mr. Moakley, you have the floor. <laughs> yeah, but you have the gavel. <laughs> John, I completely I agree feels. with you. I, I don't know what purpose this is for unless it would be a great press release that the Congress has now passed a bill that's going to get rid of all these silly uh, bills, the stupid bills, inferring that the bills that are on the books were passed by Democrats and we're going to do this thing. Now, I hope that's not what's happening. But I can't say anything else. Uh, I agree with you. The suspension calendar would be a great place. Now, we talked about an advisory committee here, and the people testifying didn't say there wasn't going to be an advisory committee. And so, therefore, I'm sure there's been a lot of uh, conversation with the speaker on what uh, uh, the role of an advisory commission is going to do. I can see this committee. Uh, being the sole committee of the Congress. Just everybody else tune in your keys, fellow, and take a long vacation. These three committees will handle, these three members of the advisory commi committee will tell you exactly what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and what color it'll be. So I would just hope that, that they would not change uh, the figures. I would hope that they would give a positive democratic spin on it and not ask Gephardt uh, to submit seven names so that uh, the speaker can pick one of the seven. Uh, you know, I think it should be freely picked by the majority minority leader. I, I know of nothing in history which justifies the uh, majority deciding who from the minority is going to serve in a particular responsibility, which is designated as minority responsibility. But well, you, know, you, raise, you raise a very good question. Here I see EPA, rainfall overflow of sanitary sewer systems. 
Now that's one of the really important questions that exists with regard to water pollution. One of the big reasons that we've got a problem in, with water pollution, particularly in the Great Lakes, is the fact that we have rainflow causing, rainwater causing overflow of overloaded sanitary sewer systems. Are you going to take away from EPA the authority to deal with the question of, of, of stormwater overflow, which is, a, which is one of the major sources of water pollution in this country? I don't think that's good. And that, the next item that they're talking about is Individuals with Disabilities Act provisions. Uh, I would remind you that bill passed this House overwhelmingly. I have some reservations. The only section in that bill that's not being criticized is the section that came out of the Commerce Committee. But I would remind you that virtually every member of this committee who was they wouldn't dare. That, when that legislation passed, voted for it. I think you did too, Mr. Chairman, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. And and, and I, now, now in one hour, uh, with, with a three-fifths vote, you propose to do away with that, with inadequate discussion and without opportunity to amend. Uh, state ability, um, the Clean Air Act. Employee commute options. Well, maybe that makes some, maybe that makes some sense. Uh, EPA penalty for standards not yet announced. That's that's something that you deal with by a simple letter down there saying, "What kind of damn foolishness is EPA doing about this matter?" That's what I always used to do when I ran the committee. Uh, and 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 and, and, and they listen and they stop that nonsense. Safe Drinking Water Act. EPA require state monitoring requirements of monitoring 25 contaminants. A lot of those contaminants are carcinogens. Now, my question is, in, in, in one hour's debate, you want to decide whether EPA is going to have the, have the ability to suppress uh, carcinogens in the drinking water of this country? And if you're, if you're foolish enough to, to rush over the floor, as most of us have to, and vote on the legislation without the vaguest idea of what the hell's in it, and then go back home, and all of a sudden your newspaper's got a front page editorial denouncing you because you allowed a serious carcinogen to be in the drinking water of, of, of the community. And then all of a sudden, on page two, you see that that particular carcinogen is in the drinking water of your community. The, this, this kind of proposal affords great opportunity for not only mischief to the public interest, but very frankly, mischief to all of us here because of the inadequate procedure which it, which it imposes on the way we consider legislation. And I would urge that, that we should be careful. Remember what the doctors say in, in their oath. They say, first, do no harm. Well, how would the, I still want to know, if, if they find legislation that's not silly, capricious, uh, stupid, uh, can they take it up under the spill? If, if they say that, that this is to do away with silly, stupid, and capricious legislation, and the legislation that Mr. Dingle just told off doesn't fall into any of those categories, so I wonder if that's a prohibition from taking it up under the bill. <coughs> Mr. Moakley, uh, you know they could. Uh, conceivably, uh, any bill could be brought up under this, same as it can under the suspension. We're not changing the rules of the House at all. Again, I'll just go back to what the, um, what the intent of the legislation is, and that is that it should be non-controversial, relatively non-controversial, not non-controversial, because uh, certainly if there's a rule out there, it's got supporters, particularly those that share that philosophy of big government uh, being able to solve all of our problems. It should be confined to a single subject, and you aren't going to uh, get involved with complex, complex glass-steagall legislation under this kind of proposal. So I, I really don't have that fear at all. Let me, let me just remind you, what you're looking at is a situation where this body is going to, in great haste, one hour to, one hour a shot, without opportunity to men, send a vast plethora of legislation to the Senate. The Senate's not going to pass most of this stuff. They're going to laugh at us, and the editorialists are all of a sudden going to get a list of, of some of the damn foolishness that we've done over here. And all of a sudden, we're going to then find that we're going to all have to go home and, and, and justify to our constituents what kind of damn foolishness we have done while we've been down here by repealing things that are of great importance to the citizenry. And I, all I'm saying to you is, if you don't think, if you don't care about the about the about the importance of having a fair process, at least, or or, or, or about having a good work product, at least think about the embarrassment that you're going to inflict on yourself with this when the Senate starts debating these things under unlimited debate, as they will do. And then, and then when the when the press comes up to you and say, uh, says to you, uh, Mr. So and So, did you vote for this? And you say, Hell, I don't know. And 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 then all of a sudden you realize, by jing, I might have. So then you call your AA and he says, Yeah, you did. 
And so then the, the newspaper comes out with a ringing denunciation of the fact you didn't even know that you voted for this ass nine piece of legislation under a, under, a, under a package of procedure which didn't let you know what the hell you were voting on. This is what you're doing to yourselves today, gentlemen. And I just urge you, and ladies, and I just urge you to know what you're doing so that you don't expose yourself to this kind of folly. John, um, every, uh, the chairman said that every, uh, that uh, the suspension calendar could handle every bill, but you know, you there are. You can handle all this on suspension. But there are uh, exceptions. You can't handle anything over $100 million, and uh, you can't, uh, and there are certain limitations. Well, the, the, the suspension process suspends in its entirety the rules. Yeah. So if, if you've got a limitation which says that you can't go over $100 million in connection with a suspension, once you pass it on suspension, it's fine. And once it's on the floor, mm. suspension is not subject to a point of order. So it's, 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 there's no impediment to dealing with this uh, on, on a suspension unless, you're, unless you don't think you can get that extra 29 votes that my friend Mr. Ross mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. diaz Bilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, uh, I'm being educated by the uh, dialogue today. And, <laughs> and, and, and I appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to, make, to, to ask questions. I don't have any questions at this time, but uh, in no way do I want to encourage the end of this fascinating dialogue. Uh, and um, uh, so I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. Mr. Bielenson? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I find myself in uh, agreement with what Ms. Collins and Mr. Dingle have said and shall not therefore pose any questions to them. Gentlemen and ladies. I've got plenty for you, Mr. Chairman, but I'll hold those for later. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, this time I'd like to submit a statement from uh, Representative Stanley Hoyer. He's in another committee trying to get by here, but I guess he's not going to do it. Without objection, and uh, without objection, we'll always uh, also submit one from Tom DeLay, the, uh, the Republican whip. Um, gentlemen and lady, we thank you so much for coming before us. It's always interesting to hear your point of view. Thanks, also, Mr. Chairman. It's always to be with you. Thank you. I'd also uh, ask unanimous Ken consent, Mr. Chairman, to put a statement in uh, for Mr. Miller and Mr. Clay and Mr. Mineta. Well, without objection, by all means, we'll put them in. The next uh, scheduled witness uh, is Mr. William Klinger. He is the chairman of the Government Oversight and Reform Committee. He has uh, done yeoman work for the last uh, 180 days or so, and uh, it seems like anyway. And uh, Bill, we appreciate your, uh, your coming before us, and please feel free to summarize, and your entire statement will appear in the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief, and Mr. Moakley, appreciate the opportunity to have the chance to testify on uh, H. Uh, Res. 161. I was also interested in the dialogue and the discussion uh, that we had with uh, Mr. Dingle and Ms. Collins earlier about uh, you know some of the legitimate concerns that have been raised about this. I don't have to share those concerns because I think this did receive pretty thorough vetting uh, in the hearing that we held uh, both with the Rules Committee and with our committee. Uh, certainly there were a lot of ideas on the table, but I think there was clearly very strong support for the concept that, this, this, that, that there have been uh, some egregious examples that there didn't seem to be a, a way to really get rid of them fast. I mean, I think if we're worried about embarrassment, some of these things have been enormously embarrassing to members of Congress who say, well, how did this thing ever happen? How did you ever happen to allow this thing to, to occur? So it seems to me that we do need an expedited process to, uh, to clean up the messes sometimes when they occur. And I think the only question is, how do we ensure that we're not uh, getting into things that, uh, that clearly do serve a purpose and that need to be uh, continued? I think this process does it. I really do believe that we have uh, pr provide some safeguards in here that ensure that you're not going to have uh, worthwhile measures uh, suddenly abrogated because somebody gets a whim that they ought to be done away with. Uh, I think a, a, you know, the three-fifths vote is a, a substantial vote. It, it obviously implies we're going to have to have more than uh, just partisan uh, wheeling and dealing in these issues. We're not going to be able to ramrod these things through. They're going to have to have uh, bipartisan support. So uh, I think, uh, frankly, Mr. Chairman, as the chairman of, of a major subcommittee, one of the concerns I expressed uh, was how this legislation would fit into the uh, committee structure and whether committees are going to be bypassed in the process. And in most cases, I think using the committee process 
provides an opportunity for stakeholders to participate in the process. That is to say, the committees are not being subverted, they're not being uh, ruled out of the process. I think this bill does address the issue and provides for committee consideration of correction day legislation. We're not creating some sort of a super uh, bunch of, uh, of uh, you know, people who are going to make these determinations. It is going to come through the committee process. Uh, and I do appreciate the, the expedited floor procedures provided in the resolution. House rules, as we all know, can be cumbersome. I mean, I, with all due respect uh, to you gentlemen on the Rules Committee, I mean, sometimes rules can be cumbersome, uh, which does slow down the process sometimes inordinately. Uh, this bill would provide for amendments. Now, perhaps not as, uh, as, as easily as, uh, as Mr. Dingle would like them to be, but there, there is a provision here for amendments. Uh, and it's in an established manner and time frame. Uh, this uh, expedited floor procedure is balanced by requiring the three-fifths majority vote, which uh, I think shows uh, you've got to have very strong support for this thing to really get through. I don't think we're going to have examples where we're going to vote for something that is going to come back and bite us. I mean, I think they're going to, requiring that kind of a vote, uh, if there were really problems here, they would arise during the discussion of these matters. So I think it's a reasonable approach. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, certainly the, the hearing that we held, there was a very strong, very broad uh, bipartisan as well as regional support uh, for doing this and for having something that would allow us to really address those really outrageous examples uh, that go beyond uh, what could be done in the suspension. So I just thank you for the opportunity to testify. <coughs> well, Bill, I want to thank you. Uh, I know you've had uh, <laughs> more than considerable input into uh, into the drafting of this legislation, and uh, uh, certainly, you know, one of the one of the major problems facing this uh, this nation today uh, is the ability for for business and industry to make a profit and to compete, particularly in a uh, in a global economy. But even more than that, uh, it's for for the small businesses and the, uh, the and the mid-sized businesses that that create all of the jobs every single year. Seventy-five percent of all those new jobs in America today uh, have, have for the last uh, 40 years been created by, not by the Fortune 500 companies, not by the GEs and the IBMs, but, but by small businessmen. And today, uh, I was a small businessman with a couple of hundred employees at one time, uh, and it was it wasn't so hard back in uh, back in those days. That was 17 years ago, but today I hear so many complaints that it costs so much money just to meet the the various regulations. And any time you do that, you take money uh, out of the the cash uh, reserves of, of a business, and there's no money to expand. There's no money to, uh, uh, to to create these new jobs. And you look at what's happening with the graduating classes today that just graduated from college and that are graduating this week from high schools, there are no jobs there. And the best thing in the world we could do is to send a, uh, a message to these bureaucrats within this, uh, this beltway and even outside the beltway that we have to be careful about how we promulgate rules that are uh, duplicative, that are uh, not needed, uh, that, um, that run contrary to maybe the state or the county uh, regulations, uh, to remove them from the backs of business and industry. And uh, this really is what this is all about. This is why we, we are trying to have a correction state to focus all of these things because that's the best way to send the message to these bureaucrats. If we can get them all together and do these things one after the other, pretty soon they're going to get the message, and it'll be the best thing that ever happened to, for jobs in America that are so badly needed today. So having said all that, I won't get into the details of the bill. We appreciate your input, and uh, let me yield to my good friend John Linder from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd just like to comment that the... It struck me, and I'd like to ask your opinion on it, Bill, that most of the comments made by the previous panel would have applied perfectly well to the suspension calendar. That's true. I mean, I think uh, Mr. Goss made the point that the only difference, we were talking about 29 vote uh, difference. And there's a longer debate period for here. Debate, than but in, in, in essence, that's exactly right. I mean, we are talking about an exp expedited procedure, and I think we're really talking about here also about a, uh, a the type of rule or regulation of law that that is way beyond anything that we would consider under the suspension. I mean, this is really an egregious, outlandish uh, uh, situation that everybody would see, I think, as something that should this be gotten be rid of, and I think it could be done uh, on a bipartisan basis. And it might be more narrowly focused than, say, the telecommunications bill last year that passed I under think, suspension? 
I think that's fair to say. I don't really, I mean, it may well be that after initial flurry, I would anticipate that this would be an extraordinary procedure. I mean, I think that, that there may, you know, there are going to be some early examples, but I would suspect that this is not a procedure that would be uh, gone to terribly often. We are putting in place some other procedures that I think are going to address uh, some of the concerns that arise here, risk assessment uh, legislation, cost-benefit analysis, uh, the sunsetting moratorium, various things that are, are, I think, addressing this overall issue. This, to me at least, is, is, is the chairman has said, it's a corrections measure. It's where a mistake, a palpable mistake, has been made uh, that should be eradicated as fast as we can, and, and, and I would be very hopeful that it would be done on a bipartisan basis, and I think it probably will be in most of I do too. I, my guess is that most of this would be used to correct the overreach of regulatory zeal rather than a mistake made in a law that we passed. Would you say that's probably? I think that's true. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bielenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your, <clears throat> your recently expressed lament may be absolutely correct in speaking about jobs and difficulties of running businesses and things of that sort. But it does not, if I may say so, make the case for the particular rule that's before us. You said, let's not, I don't want to discuss the details. But in fact, of course, that's what we're here for today. We, we're trying to write something which does make some sense, which will work well. It's a perfectly nice idea, as we've all of us agreed on a number of occasions today and, and beforehand. In the opinion of some of us, at least on this side, and I hope some of those of you on the other side, it's not been awfully well developed or fleshed out. And frankly, if I may say so again, and I shan't ask any questions, I just find it a little bit sad and disappointing that, that apparently the vast majority of the members on the majority side um, you know, are just are, are buying into this thing because this is what the, sub what the task force earlier came up with. The truth of the matter is they could have come up with a better way of handling this. I think, and I'm just appealing again to you, Mr. Chairman, and to your colleagues on that side, uh, perhaps you all, after thinking about it a bit and hearing this testimony, uh, can, can come up perhaps with our help. Uh, with some changes to this proposed rule, because it's a nice idea, but there have got to be better, more sensible ways of developing it than what the three folks who were here earlier have come up with, if I may say so, with all, with all respect to them. <laughs> well, Tony, we, uh, we will look forward to your input, and, uh, and hopefully uh, we can improve the bill. Mr. Uh, diaz Balar. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Chairman Klinger for his uh, extraordinary work on this uh, subject and, and I, I would also agree with Mr. Bielenson if, if this can be improved I'm sure we all, we all would, would like to see it improved and, and, and input I'm sure will be well taken uh, uh, but the concept uh, I mean I, I'm, I'm trying to see where it's more complex than I'm figuring it out to be I mean it, it seems like something based essentially on common sense and, and, uh, and as long as we keep focused on that I think we'll be able to come up with a good Final product, and I think that the product that's before us is uh, is uh, uh, quite acceptable. And so, uh, uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Klinger, for, for your work. I know how you've been involved in this as uh, well as uh, Mr. Dreyer and many others. Um, uh, want to uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I just uh, certainly, Mark, Mr. Bielenson, I, I can understand. I can certainly appreciate having been a member of the minority for. A, a many, many years, the concern that would be had on the part of the minority that this would be a tool that could be used in a high-handed way by the majority to, uh, to accomplish certain things. I don't see that as the purpose of this provision. To me, this, is, this really is, should be, a bipartisan provision that, uh, that enables us to, to, uh, to clean up what are very obviously outlandish uh, provisions in, in law or in regulation and should not be. I think that if it was going to be used as a partisan tool, I would clearly, and if you think that there's something in here that would allow that to happen, then I think we should correct it. Well, if I'm just very brief in response, I do think there's some things in here that would allow it, but I must say to my, to my good friend from Pennsylvania that I don't, th I don't think it was, it's intended to be uh, a partisan tool. I don't look at it really, or it's, what I believe to be its, its weaknesses as attacks on the minority or the minority rights. I just look at it as a legislator who hopes one of these days to be again in the majority, and as, as a rule or as a proposed rule that does not make an awful lot of sense, it could be done better and more thoughtfully than in fact it's been, than it has been as presented to us today. That's all I was thinking about, Bill. I just, it, I, I don't think it solves the problem properly. I don't think it's been thought through well and I, 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 wish there were, I wish there were some agreement that we could approach this nice idea, this nice subject uh, uh, in a somewhat different manner. Thanks. Thanks. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, just congratulate Bill Klinger for his fine work on this. We went through 
our subcommittee hearing before. I'm sorry I missed your testimony, but I suspect it uh, covered a lot of the things that we discussed in our hearing that we held last month. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to move ahead with a very balanced approach that recognizes minority rights and allows us to deal with what is obviously a pressing need out there. Thank, thank you. you. Bill, thank you very much for being patient. And, uh, thank and you, Mr. We Chairman. thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. The, uh, the next uh, two witnesses are a panel. Uh, they uh, come from two uh, very distinguished universities uh, in the uh, area. Dr. James A. Thurber, the uh, Center for Congressional and Pre uh, Presidential Studies, American University in Washington. Dr. Roger Davidson, Department of Government and Politics, University of Maryland, College Park, Maryland. Gentlemen, you have uh, been uh, been uh, sitting here patiently listening. Uh, I hope you've learned uh, something as we have, and uh, we certainly will be glad to uh, receive your testimony. Let me yield to my good friend, Mr. Dreyer. Thank first. you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would simply like to extend a warm welcome to uh, my very good friends, and I feel as if they're colleagues, Roger Davidson and Jim Thurber, who spent a great deal of time, uh, especially in 1993, working with us on the issues of congressional reform. Uh, it was a long and drawn out process, and by the end of 1993, and uh, up until certainly uh, the third quarter of 1994, we didn't think that we would uh, have the opportunity to implement many of the reforms that uh, my two friends had uh, helped us fashion. And I'd simply like to uh, express my appreciation to them for their uh, very thoughtful academic work and uh, to say that I look forward as we continue the process of uh, review uh, over uh, the reforms that we have made. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Dreyer, perhaps you would like to turn over. I'm going to call it away for just a few minutes. I hope you will, uh, will understand. All right. All right. But why don't you turn over? I'm sure you will be. I've taught him well. Hey, all right. I learned from Joe, too. Hmm. Should gentlemen, uh, does anyone else have a statement? I thank the gentleman for uh, his uh, comments, and I would re remind uh, uh, the chairman and also Mr. Bielenson that the last time that the two of us appeared before this committee uh, was in a different uh, uh, Congress and we were trying to persuade this committee to do something that it was reluctant to do, uh, namely uh, move on the joint committee's proposal. But now I think we're in <laughs> still in a minority role. But uh, we are in, in maybe the same. And, it, and I want to commend Mr. Dreyer's uh, role in the reforms. We were indeed in the minority then. I had a feeling. Uh, I have a feeling now of deja vu because <laughs> I think we're in the minority again. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think it's really necessary to have this reform. But if you have it, there's some suggestions that I have. Would Great. you like me to begin? Thank you very much. Go right okay. ahead, Jim. Fine. I'd like to ask uh, unanimous consent that my no remarks be put in the record. I'd like to summarize them. Uh, basically, I think everyone would think it's a good idea to get rid of dumb laws, stupid laws, uh, laws that don't make a lot of sense. The question is how you define that. And as has been pointed out earlier, that is not in the legislation uh, as proposed. I'm here to address that concern and uh, three other concerns, and I'll briefly talk about it. Um, as written, HRES 161 does not have an explicit definition of corrections. I think this is a problem. The Speaker and a proposed Corrections Day steering committee appointed by the Speaker, as far as I can tell, which is not in the resolution, would be uh, the institution to determine or define what is a correction and to place those bills on the corrections calendar. Uh, the, res the resolution would be greatly improved, in my opinion, if you had a clear definition of, of corrections. And I appeared before your subcommittee before, and at that time I felt that the corrections should be non-controversial. They should be have bipartisan support. Therefore, I support the argument, and I will not give it again, of a two-thirds support for these items, and they should go through the regular committee process, and that has been improved. Remember, it, the early proposal was that it not go through the committee process. And finally, the earlier proposal had indicated that uh, corrections could come up in bundles, many different issues in one bundle. That has been corrected also, and I commend the drafters of this resolution for making sure that they are, they are brought up singly. I want to remind the committee and the chairman of what Webster's Dictionary defines uh, as the verb to correct. It's to make or set right. 
A correction is also defined as a rectification or amendment, which is common to the Legislative Assembly here. Uh, an amendment. Uh, this just seems to me to be uh, uh, a process um, that could be used through the regular uh, uh, process here to amend bills or to bring up a bill generally. The definition of corrections under the language that is used by the presenters earlier but not, uh, but not in the bill is, quote, correcting drafting errors or unintentional ambiguities in legislation, changing regulations that have become outdated due to changing conditions, rectifying agency errors, and this is something that has not been uh, discussed today, and I think it's very serious. Reversing court decisions that impose, quote, arbitrary and unreasonable costs or burdens on private entities or state and local governments. That's a quote from the speaker. No one's talked about taking a bill to the floor to, to overturn a Supreme Court decision here today, and I think that's a very serious thing, and it should be excluded uh, from this particular process. Corrections, as I said before, should be limited to obvious and non-controversial problems. Even these changes should have substantial bipartisan support, two-thirds vote required for passage. Such motions, motions under the suspension rules has been mentioned before. Rule 27 of the Standing Rules of the House uh, uh, can be passed now. I think it's unwise to have a three-fifths vote required for passage of corrections. And I think the long-standing uh, procedure since 1822 um, is the appropriate uh, procedure for a two-thirds vote. According to one proposal, uh, Corrections Day would be created to do away with rules, regulations, and laws that, are, that are, are overburdensome and have proven to be a financial black hole. It is unclear to me what process would de determine the definition of what is a financial black hole unless you get an appropriate costing from the Congressional Budget Office, which is also not mentioned in this particular procedure. That is not required now under the rules when a bill comes out of a committee. What is dominant and expensive to one person or organization may have been uh, established and revised, in other words, corrected, after years of careful consider consideration and evaluation. Um, the authorization, appropriations, and budget processes currently determine what is to be corrected or changed in existing law, and I would go with that. An expedited procedure is currently available. We've mentioned it before, the suspension of the rules. But that procedure seems, assumes that such measures will go through the committee process, and that has been corrected in this proposal. Um, let me go to one final uh, point, and that is I'm concerned about the right of the minority in selecting who will be on the, quote, Corrections Day advisory group. Publicly, it has been indicated that this would be a group of 12 members at one point. It was a surprise to me to hear that there would be only three members on this advisory group, seven Republicans and five Democrats was proposed. Um, I think it's important to, to make sure that the minority has the right to select those five uh, Democratic members of this committee because indeed it could become, I don't know whether it would, it could become as important as this committee itself, the Rules Committee, a traffic cop, or more so. The representative rights of the minority should be protected by allowing the min minority leadership to select the minority members for this Corrections Day advisory group, and I think that that should be put into the resolution um, as drafted before it's passed. But finally, uh, I'm a conservative. You don't believe that, I know, but I'm a conservative uh, about changing House rules unnecessarily. And I've worked on rules changes since 1974 up here and worked for the reorganization of the Senate. Roger and I served on that committee, and you know our work for the, the, for, uh, the uh, Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. We were for major reforms when necessary. I think there's ample procedure in Congress with the majority that is here now to change legislation. This is, a, in my opinion, a somewhat short-sighted attempt to short-circuit the process in place and should not be instituted. Thank you very much, Jim. I'm surprised that you didn't remind me of something that I said throughout the hearing process in the Joint Committee and the Organization of Congress, that the greatest reform that we could possibly implement 
would be to simply comply with the standing rules of the House. Mr. Davidson. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, have a formal statement and would ask that it be included in the record, but I, I will not uh, read it. I just want to make several general points about this problem that's supposed to be solved by the proposal, and then to make some specific comments on the proposal itself. First of all, the problem of fixing dumb laws is really uh, the familiar matter of oversight and uh, revision of legislation. Lawmaking is always corrective. It ought to be, and every day should be corrections day in one sense or another, because that is what legislating is all about, devising remedies for uh, problems that uh, are articulated by citizens or groups. Secondly, I think lawmaking is most effective when it pursues more general principles rather than slicing the, uh, the problems so narrowly. Uh, it seems to me that existing laws should be revised as a part of the regular exercise of oversight and investigation and the the efforts that committees make and they should make further efforts than they do today uh, should be the centerpiece of uh, the process of revising and correcting laws and I might add uh, a point uh, we, we hear a lot about uh, government regulations and and we all can cite our list of stupid and overlapping and contradictory regulations but there is, in the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, a process and procedure for the promulgation and the perfecting of those rules and regulations that involve some quasi-legislative uh, actions. The rules must be published, they, there must be public comment, occasionally there are hearings and so on. So uh, these things just didn't disappear out of some smoke-filled room somewhere. The, their effect may be dumb or stupid, and they may be contradictory, but uh, there was a history to them, and if we undo them or unravel them piece by piece by piece, we ought to be careful uh, that we aren't unraveling the process that, that took place. I think we should avoid legislation by anecdote uh, or uh, one-shot legislation. I can imagine the Tooth Fairy Restoration Act or uh, the Equal Rights for All Endangered Species Act or something like that that would, uh, would perhaps gain unanimous votes on the floor and everyone could go home and, and uh, uh, write a press release saying that they had done these things. But uh, it would be a very narrow piece of legislation uh, extracted from what might be a complex series of laws. Three, members of Congress already collect vast amounts of information about these dumb laws and citizens' complaints about them. The problem is how do you get a, a, a statistical picture of those complaints and how do you process the information that comes into all 435, 440 offices every day. Uh, and this proposal, I might add to get ahead of myself, it doesn't really address uh, that problem, it seems to me. Finally, the problem is, historically, that to persuade the congressional committees of jurisdiction to take a fresh and independent view of the agencies that they supervise and the laws that they have, in many cases, nurtured and dealt with. It seems to me that is a problem that uh, needs to be addressed. How do you confront the committees, push them uh, to take this fresh and independent view? In light of th that general problem, as I see it, uh, this particular proposal is a, is a kind of puzzling uh, document. Uh, it's a solution uh, that's very attractive, but I'm not sure that it quite syncs with the problems that I, at least that I see in getting laws independently reviewed and revised. It doesn't address the real problem of getting corrections. There's no process for collecting and systematizing the information that comes into this body every day about dumb and stupid laws and regulations. And there's no mechanism, really, that I could see to push the committees to take this fresh and more independent view of the, of the programs and agencies that they've nurtured over the years. Uh, it seems to me that it's a, it's a device without a process. And, uh, that, uh, and that it voids some of the basic things that ought to be dealt with. 
So first, uh, here are the problems which I think this committee ought to clarify before you sign on to this very attractive proposal. First, clearer definition of correction ought to be arrived at. What are corrections and what distinguishes them from reauthorizations or reappropriations that include maybe hundreds, thousands of corrections? Um, how, and secondly, how will corrections measures be handled at the committee stage? I'm glad that the committees are brought into this process and that this is sort of the regular order. But is there any guarantee that these bills are going to be forthcoming? Is, is it the idea that if you build a field, uh, the, the people will come? That if you create a, uh, 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 a calendar, the bills will automatically uh, appear? I gather, reading between the lines, that this uh, troika that appeared earlier this afternoon will be uh, kind of a stimulus. Uh, they will uh, beat, uh, beat around uh, the various uh, bushes on Capitol Hill and elsewhere and uh, work up uh, legislation that might be eligible for these categories. But uh, that's a whole process that goes way back beyond or before uh, the speaker gets involved formally by designating a bill uh, to go on to this special calendar. Uh, setting up special calendars hasn't always worked to produce legislation in those calendars. Many, of, several of the calendars are relatively unused. So I think one ought to think about the whole process from beginning to end, not just when the speaker gets involved. Thirdly, uh, a new calendar for expedited consideration should include agreed upon arrangements for bipartisan uh, consultation. Uh, that's been discussed uh, at great length. I won't, uh, uh, I won't uh, belabor it. Fourth, rather than devising a new category of expedited floor action, uh, a more conservative alternative would simply be to adopt the existing procedure suspension to consider. The speaker, under the present rules, could simply announce his intention to reserve one or two suspension days each month for corrections bills. Uh, and then he would also detail the kind of correction measures that would be considered and the kind of rules under which, uh, what kind of measures would fall uh, under that classification. That would use an existing procedure, a familiar procedure that incorporates some workable safeguards and ensures broad uh, support. Finally, I think there are some other things that this committee and other committees ought to consider doing to strengthen oversight and corrections, if you will. First. The House ought to explore ways of capturing and quantifying and categorizing the vast numbers of constituent complaints and uh, uh, casework that comes into congressional offices. I've often thought if there was some way that we could systematically draw upon these data, uh, perhaps uh, with a computer system designed uh, to let staff people code in the kinds of cases that they're handling to give us a better picture, not only of what kinds of cases are coming up, but the relative frequency of them. It seems to me that's a, that's a fundamental problem that ought to be dealt with. And secondly, the House might explore ways of fostering exchanges between the members who are voicing constituent complaints and the standing committees that have jurisdiction uh, over the policies and may be perhaps defensive in some cases, about making those changes. One thought I had was having a correction forum regularly scheduled under special orders that might uh, provide an opportunity for people with these kinds of complaints and problems to confront the representatives of the relative standing committees and, and start a dialogue as to uh, what the problems really are. And that would heighten member and public interest uh, in the whole problem of how you correct uh, bad or uh, ineffective laws. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Roger, for uh, that very helpful testimony, and I appreciate uh, hearing from both of you. We haven't discussed the issue of the consent calendar. That hasn't uh, come up, and we know one of the reasons it isn't discussed is that it isn't used, and I wondered if you all might share any thoughts at all on the consent calendar itself, and if you think it's still a useful mechanism for us here. Uh, I, I learned uh, by reading the uh, 
announcement for the hearing that this was a proposal to abolish the consent calendar, and I, I guess I was a little surprised because I thought the consent calendar was a was sort of a dead letter. But uh, it seems to me that uh, measures are brought up under unanimous consent, uh, under uh, um, safeguards that seem to be, and of course unanimous consent is itself a safeguard. Uh, uh, only one member needs to object to, to stop the proceedings. So I, I don't have any great feeling that uh, we would lose uh, uh, something by eliminating the consent calendar. Mm -hmm. I think that if something is truly stupid and everybody agrees on it, you can put it on the consent calendar and, and pass it. But of course, there's, there will always be some objections to, to, uh, to anything that comes up. Mr. Chair, I, I, I want to assure you that the reason we're testifying uh, against this proposal is not because we have to revise our book called Remaking Congress if you pass it. And I want to publicly thank the Chair for writing a foreword in that book. It'll be the first book out, and it comes out in August, on the reforms that you push through the House of Representatives. And I appreciate the advance I got on that, too. Yes, that right. very helpful. <laughs> we'll share ours with you. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, Mr. Solomon. Since I wasn't here to hear the testimony, I'll rely on my good friend, Mr. Dreyer, to um, enlighten me a little bit later. But uh, we really appreciate your gentleman uh, coming for us and helping us with all the other reforms that uh, we've been able to accomplish. Thank you very much. Mr. Bielenson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to echo or associate myself with the remarks of, of, our, of our temporary chairman, our good friend from California, Mr. Dreyer about how helpful you two gentlemen and a couple of other folks have been to many of us over these past few years, especially helpful to Mr. Dreyer, apparently. But in all seriousness, no, seriously, uh, it's very helpful to all of us, quite obviously, to have some folks outside with no built-in partisan interest to sort of push us, put us in the, in the right direction every now and then and to, and to come over here and, and comment in a totally nonpartisan and kind of academic, perhaps. but more than academic manner, because you watch closely what we do here. It's very, very helpful to us, and we appreciate it very much. I just want to say one thing, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have really no questions, because I basically agree, again, as I said with some testimony earlier, with the testimony of these two gentlemen. But I, I, I was taken, especially by uh, um, Dr. Davidson's final remarks about, about where, which he suggested some ways of strengthening oversight provisions. All of us agree, I think that if, if congressional committees, and you all have the chance now, and I hope you'll push it hard, you know, with the new majority, if we did better oversight, uh, we could solve an awful lot of problems. Part of the problem around here, which people back home don't realize at all, is that, is that there are really quite, not quite enough members of this House on, on either side of the aisle who invest enough time in being legislators and going to committee hearings and learning a lot about the, the programs and the agencies which they have jurisdiction over and which they have oversight over. And if they were to ride closer, better heard on on, on these various matters, on these various people, and on these various programs, uh, they can and ought to be able to clean up a lot of these problems long before it comes to our attention. So anything we can do from this committee or from the new, the new speaker, whom I'm sure will feels the same way, to encourage oversight, uh, better oversight, will be helpful not only in this respect but in every other respect as well. But another thing that uh, Dr. Davidson mentioned uh, also uh, sounded good to this member at least when he was speaking about correction forums. Uh, regularly s scheduled under special orders. We've talked in the past about question periods where we have somebody from the administration come over, even as they have in the parliament in, in, in Britain. But it occurs to me, we should have done this ourselves before maybe you, you folks can do it. Have question periods where you, where you bring to the floor once a month or so committee chairs and provide them in advance with questions that members, other members may have of them. You know, I, I mentioned early on and some other people picked up on it. All of us get ideas back home from town hall meetings or from constituents or from letters talking about some truly stupid thing that apparently is happening. We write a letter to chairman such and such of the such and such committee asking about it and we may or may not get an answer but nothing's ever done. But if they're required on the floor to respond publicly every now and then to some of these questions and if you give them some advance notice of them uh, so they have an opportunity to find out and check with a particular agency or check with their own staff as to why and whether or not this is true and why in fact it's it's occurring and if in fact it is perhaps they'll themselves and uh, their own committee report out or, or propose an amendment to to an existing law that'll solve the problem that's not a bad idea at all it seems to me and, and I thank Dr. Davidson for that suggestion I think it's something we might well want to take you know take seriously I would just say, uh, in addition to that, that that really is the whole 
basis from my perspective behind Corrections Day is to let the American people know that there will be an opportunity out there for their member to come forward and uh, carry their proposal uh, rather than simply saying that there is not now an opportunity for us to address it. And maybe questioning committee chairman is, is uh, one alternative, but the speaker uh, proposed this idea of moving ahead with a way to uh, a ASAP uh, deal with uh, the problem that is out there. Mr. diaz Ballard. Thanks, Chairman. No questions. I have found uh, this uh, testimony extremely uh, helpful. And I want to thank uh, these gentlemen for taking the time and uh, effort for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moakley. Mr. Chairman, well, I enjoyed and agreed with the testimony that I heard before I had to get on the telephone. And uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm very had, happy to hear that uh, testimony uh, from uh, gentlemen such as yourself who really study this thing. And uh, I agree that uh, sometimes we may be uh, attacking something because it looks so silly and we end up cutting that and the rear end of a B-22 falls out or something. So, I mean, I think we've got to be very careful on what we do and how we do it. And uh, as I say, I'm very uh, happy with your testimony and I, I, I've heard you testify before and, uh, you know, you're to be commended and you're a great help to this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. It's uh, been very helpful testimony, and uh, we look forward to using your recommendations as we proceed here. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you have any announcements or if the meeting is to be adjourned. We have another panel that you, uh, you want to testify? No, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think I've said enough, but uh, I just, again, uh, want to personally thank uh, both of you gentlemen for your input. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, <clears throat> look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you thank so you much for, for coming us. with us. And. Uh, <clears throat> Might I just say that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, the chair wishes to remind members that the committee will mark up uh, HRES uh, 161, the corrections resolution, on Thursday at 10 a.m. The chair would like to request that members on both sides of the aisle uh, file any amendments that uh, they might propose by 5 p.m. tomorrow, that's Wednesday, so that we can circulate them to everyone uh, since we intend to uh, file our report. Uh, on Friday, the chair requests that any members having minority or supplemental or additional views file them with the majority office by 5 p.m. on Thursday. And again, we would like to offer out a, um, a hand to the minority if you have uh, thoughts, uh, whether they're in the form of amendments uh, to the resolution or if you just want to discuss it. Uh, do we have any, Mr. Chairman, do we have any chance of getting the, the, uh, the figure from uh, uh, three, uh, the change in two-thirds, three-fifths figure on the vote? Do we have any chance of doing that? Yeah. Well, I would, I would think not when you consider the difference between the, um, <coughs> the, uh, the suspension calendar and this calendar. If you change that to uh, two-thirds, then it would be, uh, uh, it wouldn't really be necessary to, to do this. And I don't think Chairman. that that would, uh, would really focus on the issue we wanted to. And I, and I think it's, it's uh, appropriate to recognize that, as I was saying earlier, we anticipate that most of this, I mean, I don't want to guarantee that all of it, would come up under the process of suspension of the rules, which would require a two-thirds vote. No, and I, I've heard the gentleman, and I have a lot of faith in the gentleman, but uh, there were two things that I was interested in, is, you know, the, uh, the three-fifths situation, and also uh, having the ranking minority member uh, the ranking minority leader have input on that advisory committee uh, so that we can be sure that we have somebody there that it's going to listen uh, because as you uh, realize sitting next to me that some of the answers coming in from the other side were kind of frightening on that advisory committee you know it looked like you and I would be out looking at the one ads tomorrow well, Joe, um, as you know, in the resolution itself, there is, uh, there is no advisory committee. Um, I know that uh, there is ongoing yeah. conversations between uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Speaker Gingrich and uh, Majority Leader Gephardt. And again, we just have to be frank about it and point out that there was the problem of the uh, conservative Democrats uh, worrying that they would not be represented. And somehow we kind of have to resolve that. That's the reason it fell through in the first place, uh, a, an official uh, advisory committee uh, of referral. 
And uh, I don't know how we're going to resolve that, but uh, certainly we're open to suggestions and uh, uh, hopefully we'll continue this dialogue with your leadership as well and what about, between now and Thursday. And what about giving our minority leader the right of sign-off on bills? The right of uh, sign-off on bills? Yeah. Well, he doesn't have that right, he or she doesn't have that right under the suspension calendar. There is, uh, uh, you know, consultation that goes on, yeah, but certainly uh, we could guarantee yeah, you that uh, that will happen. Yeah, but you're changing the numbers. Uh, the, the, you know, you're you increasing well, numbers by about 29. I think we should have one or the other. Yeah. Joe, you know, when you look at the, uh, at the makeup of the Congress today, uh, we, in the Republican side of the aisle, we have, I think, 200, what do we have, 231 members now? It keeps going up. You know, there keeps, there's shifts of, <laughs> like, <laughs> on a like, daily basis. Like, like everything uh, else the Republicans uh, bring here, it keeps uh -huh, going up. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, because of that, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, maybe uh, 15 or 20 uh, uh, members that are, that are not considered uh, conservative. They're moderates or even liberal in some cases. And that takes us way down below the 218. Uh, oh, then, uh, then on your side of the aisle, uh, you have in your party uh, 35 or 40, uh, you know, quite conservative Democrats. And uh, so when you start talking about getting 261 votes for anything, I mean, I've been working on my constitutional amendment now, trying to get 290, and I have 282 votes today, and uh, uh, it is difficult. It's difficult to get 261 on votes this, for anything. On this matter that only takes care of non-controversial <laughs> matters? No, no, relatively non-controversial matters. And uh, there will be controversy. What degree of relativity? Well, it depends. If you're going to repeal the exclusionary rule that's putting a thousand of my constituents out of work in, um, in uh, northern New York in a paper mill, uh, that's doggone controversial because the, the wild, uh, extreme environmentalists, they don't want to repeal that rule. And uh, yet the vast majority of the American people do, but I'm not sure we would get 261 votes. But let's, uh, let's leave it at this. We have to close the hearing. And, um, Before we do, may I ask a question? Mr. Bielinson, by all means. Thank you. Um, we were pleased that our, our kind friend, the chairman, uh, offered to, to you know, listen to, to have us submit some amendments by 5 o'clock tomorrow and that he, would, that he would, you know, look with kindness upon them. But we've, we've been worried by his specific responses to the two requests or two suggestions from Mr. Moakley. But we would perhaps would save us some time, Mr. Chairman, if you tell us which, which amendments, if we bother to prepare them, you might look upon with some... Well, Mr. 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 Bielers, I wouldn't want to speak for, for all the members of the majority, but uh, I mean, I'm not being facetious. I, uh, we I, don't, want mean to be, to, I don't mean to be either. We but want to it, be but, as fair as we can. And, uh, but, but we would hope, all I'm trying to say, Mr. Chair, Chairman, Mr. Chairperson, yeah. is that, that you would keep your mind open yet, even on such things as Mr. Moakley just mentioned, because they are important to us. And if they lead the way toward virtually unanimous acceptance of the proposal, mm -hmm. it might be worth doing, at least at the outset. So well, please don't. Uh, so please don't. You know, no, we're we just won't, asking we won't, that, that we you, won't, that you, uh, we that you not won't. say that that certain things perhaps uh, you we, know, are we not We will acceptable. not foreclose anything. And uh, with the continuing dialogue that's going on between uh, your leadership and ours, uh, perhaps we might even resolve that. I don't know. Uh, I know that there is a concern that uh, they may want to go with a simple majority. And uh, I, for one, object to that. But uh, One final thought. Yes. If, if we do set up a... a, a uh, a task force, whatever they, they call it, about putting, you know, An passing on board. these advisory board. It's not a bad idea to have it comprised of, of members of this committee. Well, the points, uh, the gentleman's I points are very well taken. In so fact, otherwise, very well otherwise taken. Otherwise, the, chair, the chairman's <laughs> going to be very offended every now and then by something this other group well, by, uh, In by fact, I think this committee should substitute for that <laughs> advisory committee. <laughs> Well, by coincidence, I've made uh, some, some similar recommendations to the leadership, perhaps. So I think what Mr. Bielenson really is asking, do you want us to come and participate in the amendment process, or do you want to face a picket line outside? Well, <laughs> I want you to know that in spite of my being involved in the defense authorization bill on the floor for the next 48 hours, uh, I'm going to be available right in that office to uh, meet with any of you. You're and always available. And nothing is foreclosed. Nothing's foreclosed. And we appreciate your gentlemen participating today. Thank you very much. Jim, Thank Mr. you all Chairman. for coming. And this, uh, this hearing is recessed, re uh, re adjourned, and uh, we will meet again 10 a.m. on Thursday morning.
Since the beginning of May, each Tuesday has been called Corrections Day in the House. This was the creation of House Speaker Newt Gingrich. Follow proceedings in the House and Senate with our 1995 Congressional Directory. It includes biographies of members, committee assignments, and information about C-SPAN programs. The cost of the guide is $12.95, including shipping and handling. To order, write C-SPAN Publications, 16...